Good morning, everyone. It's February uh, 17, 2021. It is 9.01 a.m. Uh, we are now gathering, gathering the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. As the chair of the House Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing with the potential for executive sessions to be held throughout. Please note that there is no physical locations for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the house calendar and through the, the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House Rules of RSA 91 10 Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271 3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting assisting us. Brad Graven, the community researcher. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by a roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking your roll call attendance. When each member states their presence. Please also state whether there's anyone in the room with you during this meeting which is required under the right to know. Clerk, we're going to call the roll. Morning, everyone. Morning. Vice Chairman Welch. Yeah. Representative Burt. Yes, and Representative Hopper is here with me. Representative Hopper. Yeah, like he said. Representative Green. Yeah. Representative Wallace. Present. Representative Testerman. Here. Representative True. Yeah. Representative Pratt. Yeah. Representative Marston. Present. The clerk is present. Representative Perry Gatbray. Present. Representative Pandalakis. Present. Representative O'Hearn. Representative O'Hearn, can you hear me? Yep, present alone. Representative Bourdonnay. Here, alone in my room, in the room. Representative Muse. I'm here and alone in my office. Representative Newman. I'm here and my wife is in the uh, house. Representative Bolden. Um, I'm at home. It's me, two teenagers, uh, two dogs, and a cat. Representative Conley. Representative Fly Knight. Here. Representative Bradley. Here, and my two daughters are with me. Chairman Abbas. The chair is present. And, and Representative Bolden, just when you cast your vote, please, uh, as a reminder, turn on your video. Uh, the vote will be valid. Remotely, the video needs to be on. Thank you. Chairman Burgess. Oh. At this time, uh, Representative Marston will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Representative Marson. You're welcome. This 
time we uh, you open the public hearing on House Bill 125. Representative Payne, I don't, I don't see that you signed up to testify, but I know you have a prime sponsor. Do you intend on introducing the bill? Um, thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Roy um, thought it would be good to uh, bring forth this bill and also offer an amendment. Thank you. The chair recognizes Representative Terry Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. I once again am before you asking you to consider a bill. Um, HB 125, if you recall, uh, we had last year and passed it out of committee. This bill originated um, based on an observance by the general public that some police departments were posting post arrest photographs of arrestees on social media before they had been convicted of a crime. And we determined that that was not a good thing because those pictures once out there stayed there. And if a person were found not guilty or if the charges were dismissed, the pictures were still out there associated with them at the crime. And it would make future employment difficulty and, and various other things besides um, you know, general embarrassment in the public. So we felt that that was not a good thing. So we passed a very similar bill to this last year that prohibited that. Um, I believe it got caught up in the, the Senate omnibus um, whirlwind and, and didn't go anywhere. So we're bringing it back. Um, I have offered an amendment. I hope everyone has it this morning. Um, the amendment I've offered just puts a little more clarity into when um, the police can actually release these photos. Um, if we'll just go over it real quick. It's basically the same thing as last year, but what it says is law enforcement office may publish post-arrest photos related to a crime for which the subject has not been convicted if the subject fails to appear before the court after having been granted bail or is suspected of committing a subsequent crime while on bail and the assistance of the public is necessary to locate the subject after routine non-public methods of location have been exhausted. So what that basically means, is if someone's granted bail and they default on it and don't show up in court and the police need to find them and they've used routine methods such as checking their address, checking their place of work, um, they may then publish the photo for the assistance of the public in looking for that person. And the same applies if the person commits another crime while they're on bail and the police need assistance in finding them. Um, it also says law enforcement may release post-arrest photos. The subject presents an imminent immediate danger to the public and the release of the photo is necessary for public safety. Um, and there's a numerous scenarios where you can imagine where someone needs to be found because they're a danger to their spouse or to a child or what have you. And the police need to find them. So basically that's the bill in the amendment in the nutshell. I understand there may be another amendment coming forth that would impose penalties on the police for violating this. We considered that option last year and we decided that it was not a good idea. Um, the, the public has a common law right to sue if the police violate the laws, uh, if there were this sort of pass. Implementing a fine such as $10,000 against the police, um, first of all, that's probably about a third or a fourth of a, of a policeman's salary when it could be a mistake. Um, so I feel like leaving that out, just putting the law as it is, if they violate it, the person wants to, they're free to sue and prove their case in court without um, hanging a fine over the law enforcement. Um, I, I feel that we have a better chance of getting this through without that in there. So with that, I'm open to taking any questions. Representative Muse? Just one quick question. Do you have any opposition to the publication of uh, the names of, uh, of people uh, who are accused of these crimes? So would you, 
do you think the publication of names is acceptable, but not the photos? Yeah, that, thank you for the question, Representative Mews. That, that's a, it's a really fine line we walk because at the same time, uh, we don't want the police to be arresting people in secret and the public have no access or idea who they're taking or holding. So it's, it's a difficult thing. I feel like we're, we're kind of, we're splitting the, splitting the baby on this one. And the photographs um, are easily recognizable. The names are, are can be published. Uh, they're a public record. And I think that the public has a right to know who the police are taking and holding. So yeah, it's, it's a difficult question, but I, I feel like we're gonna, with the picture, at least that's some protection. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, what was the uh, amendment number you were referring to, your amendment? Uh, just a second. My amendment number is 2021-0385H. Repeat the last four. Sure, 0385H. Representative Roy, if you don't mind forwarding that to the entire committee. I did this morning. Did anyone get it? Um, let's see. I did, and it might be 0384. Oh, you said it correctly. My apologies. Yeah, 0385. I sent it to. No, four. I sent it to uh, House Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I can resend it if you like. How about I just send it to the chairman and just to make sure. Seeing no further questions, I want to thank Representative Burke for his testimony. I'm sure we'll hear from you later today. I'm sure you will. Thank you. I just want to remind members of the public for the purposes of this hearing, we are limiting testimony to two minutes per witness. Mr. Organist Jonah Wheeler. And if there are any members of the public that have their hands uh, that wish to testify, please raise their hands now if you hear me. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to speak on this bill very briefly, just because I think that putting a, the, the distribution of arrest photos in the media or in the public creates the assumption of guilty. You know, I grew up thinking that uh, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty, but something like this with the sensationalization of pictures that go out in the media of someone who isn't even convicted of a crime has, who has just been arrested creates the assumption of guilty before proven innocent or, or guilty before proven anything before the case has even been deliberated on uh, and you know this is a problem with the media but it's also something that we can address here through the legislature uh, and I would hope that members of this body would vote um, to protect civil liberties and, and help people uh, avoid this media sensationalization, you know, media sensation uh, that can be created through this type of process. So thank you. I have nothing else to say. I yield. Representative Knight, you recognize for a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I actually have a question for you. Um, Am I allowed to ask questions as the prime sponsor or only the co-sponsors can ask questions? And if not, I, I'd like to just give a brief, like one minute testimony if I could. So, so I, I will answer the question for you. Uh, the prime sponsor is not, if the prime sponsor is a member of the committee is not permitted to ask questions. Uh, so you, you would not be able to ask questions. If you would like to testify, uh, we would, I would recognize you to testify after Mr. Wheeler's time. Thank you so much. See, seeing no uh, hands raised, um, Mr. Wheeler, thank you for your testimony. You are excused. The 
The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Knight. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, um, my members here. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of few things that um, are worth mentioning. This was on consent calendar last year. I approached um, Representative Roy and we worked in a bipartisan manner on this issue for the last uh, year and a half. I think that Representative Pentalakis also worked on this last year. So there was a really good faith effort in to address this problem. I had constituents reach out to me. Um, one um, had a job and um, driving elderly uh, folks to appointments and such. And um, they Googled her and found her arrest photo um, and it was a really long time ago and they then rescinded her job offer um, and uh, this was a dire situation in which um, she had no income and a, and a child and um, I, I really don't I, I, it really hurt that she couldn't be given a second chance at um, being a member of society. I had another constituent reach out to me um, for something that they did a really long time ago as well, and they were denied housing. Um, so this is happening in our state. Um, people are being denied a second chance after serving their time or even being innocent. But since some of these police stations on their Facebook pages have sensationalized, like, I don't know if it's for morale boosting or what have you, um, for, for doing a good job, but the, the repercussions of posting something that isn't necessarily um, affecting other people, isn't violent or self-harming, um, and also before conviction, and, and, and you see a whole town then commenting, and it, 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 it fuels this mob mentality where these these people's lives are suddenly destroyed before they're even proven guilty, or even if um, they weren't and to move on with their lives, it's, it's all on the internet forever for everyone to see. So I really think that compassion needs to be brought back um, to how we notify the public of what's going on. And this bill specifically um, doesn't take away anything that would be a danger to the public. I wanna make that very clear. Um, Representative Roy and I, we know we have a duty to inform the public if there's a uh, really dangerous, like somebody's on right now in Manchester, as an example, we had somebody just shoot somebody and kill them and they're still at large. You know, that's a perfect example of, yeah, share that photo, call the hotline. We need public safety is at risk right now. So that this is, this bill does not get rid of that. That is crucial to understand. This bill is specifically designed for people that are not a threat to the public and, um, you know, have minor infractions that, that didn't affect anybody else's life, uh, shall we say. So I just want to say that. And again, and with this was on the consent calendar. This was a big bipartisan effort just to give people in our communities a fair shake uh, is an innocent till proven guilty. Thank you, thank you Representative for your testimony. Representative Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you for taking my question, Representative. Uh, the first two cases that you explained uh, about you know, the loans and uh, or where she worked, um, were they convicted or they were just accused? Because I think this bill only does accused, correct? Can you um, please tell me if you see that on a certain line so I can jump right to it and help clear that up? A follow-up, Mr. Chairman? Representative Hart, you recognize for a follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, no, what, what I'm getting at is your first, you, you said about this lady that drove for this, uh, you know, for appointments. If I understand the bill correctly, the bill only 
if you're accused. So I'm just curious, was this lady, you know, charged? And if that's the case, this bill wouldn't have helped her. So I'm just confused on what the bill. I was told she wasn't. It was for a minor driving infraction. Um, uh, again, it's it turns out when we hear stories from constituents, sometimes um, we don't always get the full story. But I did some research um, and you know, even if this weren't to help her, I'm, I'm hoping this will help others because I have uh, looked at Facebook responses of, of different uh, police uh, police offices around our state. And I, I'm saddened that this is starting to become a trend on social media. So I have, I have seen this multiple times from multiple different police uh, departments. So I'm not, I can't accurately say if this bill would have helped her. I'd like to believe it would. I don't have the entire story on that part, but I've had heard complaints in regards to this. And like I said, I've seen the posts and I just don't think it's fair. I don't think that you can tell the public one thing you can say, watch out for this person. They're a danger, but to post somebody that's not a danger or risk to society, shame them either for mental health issues, substance use disorders, and then get, keep the comments open. It's one thing to also notify the public, but then have a whole, the comment section open. So people can say the most abhorrent things uh, and, and take away someone's humanity. Um, this is really, that's the intent of this bill. So I hope it would help her. Um, I, I realized there was a problem when she came to me her specific case, though, I, I cannot say to. All right, thank you. Seeing no hands raised. Seeing no hands raised, uh, Representative, may you are excused. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, one, Mr. Chairman. Joseph. Hello, can everyone hear me? Is it, is it Lacaza? La, Lascaz. Oh, excuse me. Yep, no problem. Lascaz, yep. No, sure. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee for hearing my testimony today. My name is Joseph Lascaz. I am the Smart Justice Organizer for the American Civil Liberties Union of New Hampshire, and I will be testifying in support of this legislation today. Um, there's, there's many things that have been said already uh, concerning uh, mugshots and what that means when it's pre-conviction. Uh, a mugshot captures the individual when they're often at their worst moments in, um, in life and they are taken at a time when people are supposed to be presumed innocent. And oftentimes there is a, a stigma um, of assumed guilt that happens or comes with a mugshot being taken. And if mugshots are publicly released before conviction, there is no way to revoke them if the person is acquitted or charges against them are subsequently dropped later on. So instead, a mugshot will live um, you know, indefinitely online and it will follow individuals even after their cases have been resolved and, you know, and taken care of. I do, you know, I, I could, I could go more into that, but I just want to, I do want to say this, that in 2005, I, I myself have been, had my mugshot put on the front page of a newspaper. And in 2005, um, my mother ended up in CMC hospital for several days because the first time she found out from a stress-induced heart attack from seeing my mugshot on the newspaper before I was convicted. So it's not just the individual um, who is presumed innocent that, uh, that suffers, but also people around them um, as well. I do want to, I do want to, you know, state that the ACLU strongly does support chapter 91A and does believe in public transparency. However, uh, this is one of the rare cases where the public's interest in someone's mugshot is outweighed by the prejudicial nature of a mugshot before there's even been a conviction. And mugshots do not provide any information that cannot be obtained from a police report or any other written materials. 
And I do want to say, if the press wants a photo of someone who has been arrested, there's no reason why they cannot attend the arraignment or any other court proceedings that will happen and get their pictures there. Um, and we would not be the only state to do this. New York has restricted uh, similar access to mugshot information, though this legislation is more targeted insofar as it's limited to pre-conviction mugshots. Um, I do want to state that this bill does not prevent law enforcement from releasing the details of an arrest, including someone's name, as was stated earlier. And it, it only restricts the release of a pre-conviction mugshot, which is uniquely prejudicial. Uh, this bill does allow for a disclosure pre-conviction where the subject of the photo is a fugitive from justice, as was stated, and if they pose an immediate and ongoing danger to public safety where disclosure is necessary to convey a witness or police officers in the performance of any valid law enforcement function. So for these reasons and more, I support this legislation. The ACLU New Hampshire supports this le legislation and we hope that you will vote ought to pass. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. Representative Hopper. Uh, point of our order, Mr. Chairman, what's the time limit for testimonies or is there one today? You recognize for a point of order. The chair is setting a two minute time limit. However, our next public hearing is until 9.25. So there, it is at the discretion of the chair to allow a witness to go beyond that. Because there was no one signed up to testify with their hands raised, uh, I love two witnesses that actually go well beyond the time limit, but when there are any time constraints, that will be strictly enforced. Thank you. Seeing no members of the public with their hands raised, we now close the public hearing on House Bill 125. And Mr. Chair, we had uh, uh, signing in in support of the bill uh, were 94 people and we had three people who signed in in opposition. Thank you, Representative Muse. Three. And Mr. Chairman, a point of order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I keep hearing a uh, telephone. If somebody could mute that telephone if that keeps going off, that would be very appreciative. Uh, I think it's disruptive of the committee here. Although I agree that, that Telephone going on is extremely disruptive. I don't think that's a proper phone board. But whoever's telephone is on, please put that on mute if they don't mind. Generally speaking, we're not supposed to use electronic devices in the room. Obviously, we have exceptions because we're all so please be respectful. Thank you. We'll be we'll be uh, adjourned from 945. Are we going to object this?
Are you ready? Ten can you hear us? I don't think the people at home can hear us. I don't think she's there. We're right. able to hear you. David Muse, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Oh. Guess you guys like like to hear the chair repeat himself. <laughs> All right. At this time, the, the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee we will open the public hearing on House Bill 129. And the chair recognizes Representative Testament. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Representative Dave Testament. I'm from Merrimack Two area. Uh, it represents. Franklin and Hill. Uh, <clears throat> I introduced this bill because uh, a few months ago, or actually more than a few months ago, Apple loaded a uh, app on your iPhone, if you have an iPhone, and in it, it, it did not activate it, but what it was, it was for locating you in times of COVID. Uh, and I objected to the fact that they could actually activate it without me knowing it. And I looked into it and there are apps like this, which would activate when you're within a few feet of another person who also had a similar uh, piece of software. And the, the need for it was to effectively put a scarlet A on your forehead so that if you uh, had a vaccination or didn't have a vaccination or you know you had you've been tested positive for uh, COVID, uh, they could notify a person in close proximity of you uh, that you know you were uh, a deplorable. Uh, and I objected to this. So that's what this bill does. It says if you're going to put that kind of a software on and activate it, you need to let the person know. Now, I, what worries me, and I don't know how to cure it, is that even with that, we all get software on and we just keep saying, okay, okay, with the licenses and we seldom ever read them. So I can probably get uh, a burn on this particular uh, app if I'm not careful. But I, I wanted to make this abundantly clear that this kind of a, of an application in New Hampshire is not allowed. Any questions, I'll take. Representative True, you are recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, nobody's going to sneak an app onto my phone. But <laughs> In this, in this case, the app could be on your phone when you've got a, a new a new phone. I'm old enough to, to have had some some older phones, and I don't know if there's any if they can be updated at all, um, or what kind of apps would be on. I can, I'm just not familiar with the. Representative True, you're recognized for a follow-up question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, but what I meant is if, if somebody goes out and buys a new phone, a brand new phone that does everything, do those phones, could those phones come with this app that you wouldn't know of? Yes. Since the, these companies who make these phones send out updates to the software, uh, this one I was talking about, just showed up one day on my phone, but it hadn't been activated. Representative Pantelakis. Uh, thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Uh, is this bill saying that 
um, no one can have this kind of app on the phone in the state of New Hampshire. Says that nobody can have it on their phones if they don't want it. It can be on the phones. And there can be some percentage of the people who would have it. But it says that if they're going to put it on there, they need to really let you know. Thank you. Representative Muse. I just had a question about um, how you how you knew uh, the app was actually installed to your phone, and did have you deleted it? Uh, the app was when you went back into the uh, in, into the settings and so on. There was a location. Uh, you could turn on uh, if you wanted to accept that kind of app. The only way I found out about it was reading some technical journals and they told me where to look. And I said, yeah, it's there. I just, you know, it, it surprised me. Representative Buse, you recognize for a follow-up? Was the app activated without your knowledge? So. Uh, uh, did you confirm that you were actually being tracked by the app? It was not activated. It, Apple, knowing that it would be controversial, you know, didn't. They installed it, but they didn't turn it on. Thank you. Representative Bradley, recognize for a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, do you use the easy pass that the state gave us? Yes, I do. Bradley, you recognize for a follow-up question? Um, did you know there's a tracker in the easy pass? I do. Okay, thank you. <sighs> Representative Gathright, you recognize for a question? I know that there's a group that you could report this to. I don't know whether it's the FCC or who it might be. Have you tried going that route? Once federal? Uh, I thought I would do it just in the states. I mean, at the state level. My experience in trying to get something through the federal agencies like FERC and so on. It's been, it's not been very successful. So I didn't, do, I didn't <clears throat> tell them that they couldn't do it. There's no, there's no way for me to stop them from putting it on home. There is maybe a way to stop them from activating, from, from making, you know, making me you know, knowledgeable of whether they've activated or, or give me the option. Representative Bolden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Do I understand correctly that the exposure notifications app on the iPhone is not functional in New Hampshire as it requires the active participation of DHHS and they've announced no intention uh, to participate in this app? I don't know if DHHS is, I, uh, but I don't want to wait for somebody's intentions. You know, I'd, I'd like to see it stopped in its, its tracks. Representative Burt, you recognized for a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative. So basically what you want, if I'm hearing correctly, is, is when Google you know, follows us uh, and, you know, sells that information, you want them to clearly tell us that they're doing that. But then, you know, what are you going to do about the NSA that's doing the same thing? I can't stop everybody. I can just raise a hand, a hand and say, you know, I really don't like this. Thank you. 
Representative O'Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question or two. So in reading the proposed LSR you have in front of us uh, and listening to your testimony. Can't hear him. No. Talk Representative O'Hearn, can you speak up, please? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, please speak louder. I, unless I'm yelling. You don't mind. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so in reading your uh, proposed LSR and listening to your testimony, uh, I'm trying to understand how in the LSR it says that uh, no person shall, without consent, place, locate, or install an electronic device. As we all know that those uh, phones are not really manufactured in New Hampshire uh, and come pre-downloaded uh, with these apps unless you specifically download another app. So how, based on this, are we looking to enforce this? <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, the way I would enforce it is uh, each phone store or person selling a phone in New Hampshire would have to have the ability uh, to go in and, and turn it off. Uh, and when they're bringing a phone into New Hampshire, not, when, when a company is trying to sell a phone in New Hampshire, they would know that for New Hampshire, we have to have certain settings. Uh, I don't think it would be difficult. Follow-up? recognized for a follow-up question. <clears throat> well, thinking of that terminology, most uh, phones that I have bought uh, have been um, sealed, and most customers would want a phone that hasn't been already opened and uh, taken out and unload, uh, turned on, I guess, would, be, would you please? Thank you for the question or the comment. The, the way I would, would see it is if I go to the local Apple store, uh, when I picked up the phone from them, they would take it out and, just to, and you know, would, would help me set it up. And part of the setup would be shutting that off if I didn't want it. Uh, it. It's not going to be easy, and I would like to make it difficult for the manufacturers to install this. And hopefully, they would take it off all the phones at that point. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Testament. Do you know? Two questions is one is when did you realize that this took hap it took hap when it happened that you saw it on there? And is it also on all phones other than just Amazon? <clears throat> just try to limit one question if you reference for phone. I, I I realized it when I read about it last summer, I pray. Uh, and uh, and it was specific to an iPhone. I don't know whether Android has it, but I suspect that they would probably follow suit if they don't, haven't already done it. And I just checked, and yes, this particular kind of software, this switch to, to, en to enable it, was there. Representative Green, do you recognize for a follow-up question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, did you take it to an Amazon store and see if they could remove it? No, I did. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no further hands raised, Representative O'Hearn. Last question. Uh, thank you. Aaron. And, and Representative O'Hearn, please speak up. We will not take offense if we feel that you're young. Okay. I'll try to maybe use a different device after this. Uh, what is the penalty if they do not comply? Excuse me, I, I didn't understand you. I'm, I'm a, what is the penalty if they do not comply with this? I don't have one. I, I, I could. Yeah, there is not one. Representative Knight, you, you recognize for a question? 
Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Um, don't you think it's the consumer's responsibility to understand the product they're buying and know how to operate it and use its functions? I fully agree. That's why I'm asking. They can install this software at least if they if they fully inform the the consumer that it's there and that they can either turn it on or turn it off. So I I agree with you fully. Follow up, Chair. Representative, now you recognize for a follow-up question. Are you aware that there's already information before buying this product on labels and signed contracts to notify the consumer of, of, of exactly these functions? I, I'm not, I, I know there's a lot of times we all install stuff on our, uh, our phones, our computers, and it says, you know, acknowledge that this license says something and we just go ahead and and you know push the next button so i know a lot of people won't worry about this uh but i'd like to be notified if they do it thank you thank you uh seeing no further hands raised uh, the witness is excused i want to thank her for the testimony for the testimony thank Seeing no members of the public with their hands raised, Representative Houston, do you want to read the numbers? If I mute yourself, Representative Houston. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I, I, uh, I, I didn't uh, download that particular one and I just need to find it very quickly. Here it is. Um, on HB 129, we had uh, eight people signing in in support and five people signing in in opposition. Thank you, Representative Mews. At this time, we now close the public hearing on House Bill 129. At this time, uh, the chair is now opening the executive session on House Bill 579 on, on the 17th day of February 2021. It's 10 5 a.m. Here is recognizing. Representative Welch and Nathan Lewis. Move that 575 be retained. Second. Excuse me. Is it 579? Sorry, 579. Representative Wallace, would you like to be recognized to second that motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I second that. Wish to speak, anyone wish to speak on this on the motion for change? Representative Conley, it's only two. Um, is there any reason we couldn't advance this to the House for a vote this year? Is that a question? It is more rhetorical, I guess, but. Uh, I would just say that uh, in, a, in, in consultation with both the responses of the bill, I believe the intention of this bill is good, and I hope that this committee will work on fixing the notice requirement, which is the notice issue was. Uh, it, it, I don't believe the notice provision as written in the proposed bill would have been effective. Uh, I, I think that we need to sit down and get this right. And I, and I did consult with the sponsors on this and they're on board with the team. Thank you, 
Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, looking at looking over my notes, it's probably my mistake, but do we know from Representative View how many supported and opposed this bill? I don't know the information off the top of my head. And I would have to go back and check my email on that one, um, which I'm doing. At this time, we'll see no further hands raised for the discussion. Uh, we can have enough to put the question on the motion to retain. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I do have an answer to, uh, uh, to the representative's question. On uh, HB 579, uh, 205 people signed in in support of this bill and nine people signed in in opposition. Seeing no further hands raised, the clerk can now call the roll. If you in support of the motion to retain, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burt. Yes. Representative Popper. Yes. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yes. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathray. No. Representative Cantal Office. Muted. Laurie, you muted. Representative Pantelakis, you need to unmute yourself for the vote. Sorry. Representative Pantelakis, you need to unmute your device. Please say yay or nay. Perhaps a thumbs up or thumbs down. Continue with the wall. Representative O'Hearn. Yes. Representative Bordenay. Yes. Representative Muse. No. Representative Newman. No. Representative Bolden. No. Right. Representative Conley. No. Representative Klein Knight. No. Representative Bradley. No. Representative Pantalakis. No. Chairman Abbott. Sorry about that. The chair votes yes. Thirteen gay. By a vote of thirteen yays and eight nays. The motion to retain passes. It's, it's always a motion to retain, so no report. No so we will close the executive session on House Bill 579. The chair is now opening the executive session on House Bill 195. For the record, it is the 17th day of May, 1 and 10, 12 a.m. 
The chair is recognizing the Madam Clerk to make a motion of on behalf. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion of on pass for House Bill 195. Representative Marston. I'll second that. The motion of the pass has been seconded by Representative Marston. Representative Brooks, would you uh, wish to speak to your motion? Yes, I would. Um, listening to the testimony on this bill, there seem to be some questions um, over, over displaying or hysteria. And I think that there's a huge difference between displaying a firearm to prevent something if you are being threatened to dispense that threat versus walking into a situation to create hysteria to be reckless. We are now open to uh, the question for discussion. Seeing no hands, seeing no hands raised, uh, the matter we put the question. Mr. Chair. Oh, excuse me. Representative Borday. Mr. Chairman, I have to oppose this uh, motion off the pass. Uh, we have no uh, definition for display firearms, and it is very ambiguous. Um, so I can't uh, support it, this becoming law. Representative Hughes. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we also heard uh, testimony uh, that the difference between display uh, and brandishing uh, is very uh, ambiguous. It's not something that's actually defined in our statute. I know we spent a lot of time on that in the public hearing, but but I think one of the, the more persuasive pieces of testimony that I heard uh, was when the topic of coercive control was discussed. So in, in essence, the, the very act of showing somebody a firearm in a confrontational situation um, is an act of, of coercive control. Um, and one of the reasons why this is in our statute now is this, this is an act of violence. Uh, and this is something that uh, should not be removed from our statute. It's something that should remain in place. Representative Marston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There was no amendments to this bill. I'm trying to recall if that was okay. There's been no amendments presented to this committee. Thank you. Representative Newman. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm opposed to this bill also. Um, my main fear is that uh, when we have people displaying guns in road rage incidents, um, it seems like a very dangerous situation to me. You get one display, one then the other one will have a shootout on one of the roads. Um, I think it's just a very dangerous bill and I'm opposed to it. Representative Knight. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm opposed to it as well. I remember asking the question of one of the sponsors, um, what his intent was, and he said he wanted to scare people so they wouldn't uh, escalate things. And he also stated he'd respect somebody that would try and scare him brandishing or um, displaying their firearm as well. Um, I, I just don't feel comfortable with the, the intent that that was given to us on the record by the sponsors. I think that this is a, has very dangerous consequences and hasn't been uh, thought out properly. And um, I, I, I will say that if this were to pass, I could see a major increase in deaths going up due to firearms in our state. Thank you. Representative Welch. Yes, I would I'd like to suggest that a good example of a display would be you're walking down the street, somebody comes out of an alley and says, empty your pockets. You open your coat and show that you are armed. And, come out, and, and the guy runs down the street, grabs the cop and says, this guy just struck me with a firearm. That's not the way it's supposed to be. 
And criminals are supposed to be the ones that get caught, not the victims. And this way, it's already in statute, 631 column four, page 584 in our book. So I think it's just a continuation of something that we uh, put in place several years ago. When Ward Bird up in Moltenboro got convicted of threatening a woman who had trespassed on his property. He never showed the gun, but it was in his, uh, in his belt in the back of him. When he turned around to go in the house, she saw the gun and went down to the police station and turned him in. They get convicted. That was the reason. That's why we have something in, in 631-4 now. I'm going to support the bill. Representative Gabbard. Um, I'm definitely against um, supporting this bill. One of the things that the same the day that we heard this in the hearing, I was online and looking up the definition of brandish and sort of was waiting till we got to this point. Um, synonym, flash, shout out, weld, display, disport, and that's literally in the dictionary. So for you to say that display is anything other than brandish, I would disagree with you. In regards to display versus brandishing, that's when I first looked, read, looked at this bill, I, I had the same concern. Under the federal definition, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the display, brandishing is when you display a firearm and it's coupled with a threat. Um, and that threat is particularly meant to intimidate someone. New Hampshire has been an open carry state as long as I can remember. Before, long before it was a constitutional carry. You know, open carrying is a, is a example of displaying. Uh, hearing a lot of the, the testimony and comments is really um, I, what, the reason why I support this bill because what I'm hearing is that anytime someone displays a firearm, people are considering it a threat, and that's the exact problem in the law that this is intended to fix. And for that, I will be supporting the motion of our pass. Last Let me just let Representative Hopper. Representative Hopper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to, to uh, delve into this idea of forwards of control. My grandson's six foot one and he's pretty strong. So when he asked me for a, to stop at Subway, I could think that that's force of control, but it really isn't. I mean, we, we there's people. The examples used are people that have a gun are in a dominant situation position, but that's really true throughout our lives. It's always a situation where there is somebody in the room that is more dominant or in control. Right now, you're the chairman of the committee, so is that coercive control? I mean, I, I think it's um, unrealistic to think that we aren't there isn't full birth of control throughout our lives, and we have to learn to you know, deal with it. Thanks. Jeffrey? I agree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I mentioned sometime before when we were discussing this that there are people, and I do know some people that would not shoot a person, but they carry a Empty gun, it's not loaded. And this would be a way for them further to protect themselves. Jeffrey? <laughs> um, can you, um, how many people supported it? And how many opposed it that day? I didn't bring my notes from last week. I have that answer. Thank you. Representative Marson. According to Muse at the time, I wrote down person four. Person representatives. I'm sorry. Representative Muse. Yes. He said supported it was 42, opposed was 156. Thank you. Representative Rhodes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> During a lot of these stand your ground bills, we, we heard a lot of people testify and say, well, I'm sure that it's, you know, it's traumatizing to people that have been in this situation, but, but I'm afraid, but what about my feelings? I think everybody needs to step back because if you are that person that is being threatened or your loved one is being threatened and you're the one that has the ability to stop it with just showing the handle of a firearm, you're the good guy. You are the good guy. Walking in to negotiate a contract and taking out your firearm and placing it on the table, well, now you're a jerk. But using a tool, as Representative Bullen had stated, not all tools are meant for everybody to use, right? Her husband might not be great with the chainsaw, but mine is. And if I have the ability and I'm trained and I know how to use my firearm and so does everybody in my family, we should be able to use it. And let me just also say that if I'm in a convenience store with any single person in this room and someone's trying to threaten your life, I will protect you by showing that I can. That is all. Thank you. Representative Bradley. Um, thank you, Chairman. I will be voting against this bill. I think it's dangerous. I think it's unclear of what, um, you know, we keep talking about display and brandishing, but it's still not clear. And Rep Rhodes, I appreciate that you do get training. I think that's that's fantastic, but not everybody does. And when I go to the grocery store, if I'm bumping into somebody and they turn around and show me something and I have my two kids with me, that's scary. I don't care. And I appreciate that you took the time to get trained. I have no idea what type of training that person has. And all I wanna do is go grab eggs and milk. And now I am worried. So I appreciate what you've said, but it's a slippery slope. And if everybody has a chance to be walking around brandishing or displaying a weapon, I mean, what are we asking for? This is this is ridiculous. Um, that's, that's, I just think this is a scary bill. This makes no sense. Um, so I'm 100% against it. Just to say, just from my perspective, I think I've been here in 1986, 1987. As far as I can remember, the hand has always been an open carry state. And I think the concern is that by open carry, you are displaying a firearm. And it is a, it's a lawful act, and it always has been simply to open carry. Yeah. Before it became a constitutional carry state, if you didn't have a permit, you actually had the open carry. And the permit was the concealed carry. So open carrying is, is, is a tradition of this long been exercise, but what I'm hearing is that people find that act to be in of itself threatening, in which would, and if you're displaying and threatening someone, you are now brandishing. Now I will say, personally, I, I, don't, I don't open carry. I don't, I don't find the need to. And to be honest, most people don't, but it doesn't mean that it's, Simply, if someone is open carrying, they are committing, or they have threatened So, I mean, police officers do it on a regular basis. And it's a public trust for her. I, I just, I just explaining that it's this is something that the difference between brandishing and displaying needs to be distinguished. That displaying does not involve a threat. Representative Knight. Thank you. I really appreciate Representative Rhodes' passion on this. I share a similar passion, but for the opposite opinion, I feel as someone who has been threatened uh, multiple times in my life, I feel that everyone also has a right, at least in my district, to feel safe. And I've heard overwhelming amount of my constituents reach out to me that this bill makes them feel 
less safe. And I heard that was the intent also of the bill. If I hear a legislator that's saying their intent is to scare people and we have overwhelming amount of numbers of our own people. And by the way, Mr. Chair, with all due respect for both sides on a bipartisan issue, you can change the form. We should be requiring people to put the state they're from, the city and the zip code. And it's on record that they're telling the truth. And we need to amend that form the sign-in sheet immediately for both bipartisan reasons. And I have to say that if we can determine people in New Hampshire and we're representing them and hearing their voices, those numbers, those are facts. That's the data. And also, yes, you have a right to protect yourself. And yes, you know what? It's already there in, in the Constitution that you can do this. We can't determine how many people are trained. We want to bring more guns for them, where there was no data on, and, and there was no necessary requirements on how to use this uh, tool properly. There, there's just a complete black hole when it comes to accountability on this law. And that means you can get away with murder. And that scares people. And I just want to make that really clear that you can protect yourself, but other people, they have a right also to feel safe and be protected by their representatives and vouch for, for, for the things that they need to continue their lives and go to the grocery store without feeling like all of a sudden everybody has a gun just to scare each other. Thank you, Representative Knight. Just may the record reflect when it comes to the sign-in sheet, the chair has no authority or discretion to alter or change that. So if uh, there's any issues with the sign-in sheet, uh, I would, I'm not the person that needs to, that needs to be directed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A follow-up on that, I was just told that um, you, that each uh, committee is different and you have back end access or somebody does at least to help you and require more information on the sign-in sheet. You can, you can, uh, as an admin, you can do that. You can be recognized. I, I envision we'll have a lot of uh, passionate discussions in this room, so it's, it's helpful if people recognize who they are. Representative Kendall Lapis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like you to clarify for me what this bill does. I'm hearing from other people that if someone's coat is open, people are getting arrested. Is this what they're saying? So what, I, what, I, what this will do is RSA 631-3. A person is guilty of reckless conduct if if he recklessly engages in conduct which places or may place another in danger of serious bodily injury. And what this is doing, what this bill would do is that by simply displaying a firearm, he would not be considered to be engaging in reckless conduct as defined under RSA 631-3. The mere fact that you're displaying the firearm, which is either showing in whole or in part, or letting it be known verbally that you are carrying a firearm. You don't even have to display, you don't even actually have to physically show. Uh, that in and of itself <coughs> will not amount to reckless harm. Follow up. <coughs> yes, I I real I'm going to vote against this bill because I don't think anyone should be allowed to take a gun out and to aim it at somebody, even if they don't intend to hurt them. This is bad, and it's not good for the future of this of the state. Thank you, Representative Blagas. Thank you. I, I I will just say I, I it, This is my opinion. I believe if someone were to point a firearm at someone, that would uh, ride, uh, go beyond the level of display. That's and that would be reckless conduct because the when it comes to 
and I'm not an expert on firearm training, but I, I know that you never point the firearm at any person or anything unless you intend on, on shooting it. So if someone were to do that, I think that is beyond this point. If they were to point it. Can I just follow up? Yes, Representative Lodge. Then why is this bill necessary? I believe Representative Welch uh, would, would speak to that. He, he referenced the Bird case. And, uh, I, think what, I was there. What, what is happening is when by simply displaying a firearm, people have been charged with reckless conduct simply for displaying a firearm. And Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could Present. we get some data on that before we pass this bill? I don't have any data on it, but I believe we're in the executive session, so the intent is to vote today. Thank you. Representative Welch? Yeah, Laura, this is to answer your question. I know you were in the committee when we did this. But on page 584, halfway down the left-hand side, this existing statute says, a person who responds to a threat, which would be considered by a reasonable person as likely to cause serious bodily injury or death to the person or to another, by displaying a firearm or other means of self-defense, with the intent to warn away the person making the threat, shall not have committed a criminal act under this section. That's the existing statute. And all this does is address reckless conduct in the, in the previous uh, paragraph. Thank you. Representative Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm definitely going to support this. Uh, I agree there's a lot of people that disagree with people open carrying, uh, but I open carry all the time. I go to the supermarket, I go to Walmart, Target, uh, Home Depot. Um, and I did have a small incident, uh, this kid, uh, you know, he was 20 something years old. Um, and he was cutting across lots on my private property uh, behind my shed. And, and he, to be honest, he's kind of startled me when I saw him. I was like, well, what's going on? <laughs> And he looks at me and he says, oh, I'm just cutting through. And I said, well, that's what the road's for. You know, you aren't supposed to be cutting through private property. So we had a nice conversation. Uh, but when he looked down, because I was open carrying that day, and he saw the, the sidearm, he goes, oh, hey, sir. Um, I said, well, don't worry about it. It's, it's an honest mistake. You know, just don't do this. You don't walk through private property. You know, at that point, he, he moved on. I, it was all over. Um, but what happens if it was somebody that went and reported me for having my sidearm on my hip as threatening, which I didn't, you know, and that's what concerns me. And that's why I support this bill because I don't want to get caught up and caught up in anything like that. Um, you know, because I'm a peaceful man, I carry a gun for my self-protection and my family. Um, you know, I pray every day not to ever, ever, ever use it, but I want that option. And, um, you know, so that's why I support the bill. Thank you. I just have a question. Who seconded was it Marston? Yes, there was a Marston. Seeing, seeing no further hands raised, now we put the question. No, no. On the computer. What did I say? Muse. He's waving. Oh, is it muse? Yeah. I apologize, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for the people who are remote. Oh, sorry, it's my computer. I apologize, Representative Muse. Thank you. Um, I think the issue for me isn't so much carrying a weapon openly, and and I think we're kind of confusing the issue here a little bit. Um, open carry, uh, for better or worse, uh, is something that is part of our law. Um, the problem that I have is when you're carrying a weapon and you call attention to the weapon uh, for the purpose of basically 
coercing people into some, some coercing a person into some type of different behavior or winning the argument. Um, I think that's, that's a big issue. Uh, it's one thing to do what Representative Burt did, which, which is to carry uh, a weapon around on his own property. That, that's fine. That's something you're freely allowed to do in New Hampshire. Uh, but when you call attention to that for the purpose of changing the behavior uh, of another person, and, and, I, and I use as an example, I think you know, we, we hear a lot about the defensive example of somebody who might be threatening to you or somebody who might be presenting a threat to you. But uh, we're also in a situ situation or we're going to be in a situation hopefully soon where we have people coming back to the legislative office building and testifying. So, you know, one of the issues is that uh, firearms are allowed in the legislative office building. And so it's perfectly possible that, uh, you know, all of us could face, you know, people sitting out there in the audience um, who are opening up their codes and letting us know just sort of what they think of us as we sort of vote up or down on certain bills. And I, I think if you take a look at it, 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 the broad range of examples, um, I think you can really sort of see the wisdom of leaving the statute the way that it is uh, and, uh, and not passing this bill. Thank you. Seeing no further hands raised. <laughs> Representative Hopper. Uh, just a quick one, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I might have remembered this incorrectly, but I think one of the testimonies we heard when the bill was presented was a case, I believe it was in Manchester, where a woman was being attacked out in the driveway and the boyfriend and or husband came out and he grabbed his handgun on the way down to defend her. And he was, uh, I believe, arrested for brandishing when he never pointed at anybody. But he used it as a uh, tool to try to protect his, his loved one. So I think that's that's what this bill uh, is attempting to do, is to make sure people like that aren't arrested for just protecting their family. Thank you. <clears throat> Seeing no further hands raised, <laughs> you guys are gonna hurt. The matter will be put to question. The motion on the floor. Uh, the motion right now is not to pass. If you are in favor, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Madam Clerk. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yes. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. <laughs> Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathright. No. Representative Pantalakis. Oh. Representative O'Hearn. No. Representative Borden A. No. Representative Muse. No. Representative Newman. No. Representative Bolden. No. Representative Conley. No. Representative Klein Knight. No. Representative Bradley. No. Chairman Havis. The chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 11, yay, 10, nay. I am a vote of 11 yeas, 10 nays. The motion on the pocket pass. Passes. Pass. Maybe a, uh, anyone want to go majority report? Um, Would you like to do the majority report? Yes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will someone be doing a minority report? May that, may that representative be identified or share shares records? 
Representative Tommy, you step up a lot in regards to these reports. Thank you. At this time, we will close the executive session on House Bill 195. Committee will be in recess for three minutes until so ten twenty five. Are there much amendments? So rather than pass them around, just we'll leave them on the table right here. Just pass them. No Surprised nobody's coming to excuse you. That's not really 
morning. We're opening the public hearing. Also, two eighty six. Uh, yes, thank you so much. You recognize to speak. And just before we begin testimony, I want to remind members of the public that your testimony will be limited to, to one minute per witness. And, and members of the committee, we have limited two questions per witness. It does not apply to the uh, representatives introducing the time. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I was waiting for to be recognized. Thank you so much. Uh, so, thank you, members. I uh, know you've heard a lot from me today. I'll try and make this brief. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, a couple months back, um, there was a situation in Manchester uh, where we had a, a large displaced community that had um, nowhere to go. And they um, made camps up at the courthouse in Manchester. And um, the state didn't, did not quite know how to handle the situation. And there was no real um, plan on how to execute uh, a, a fair way to relocate people or get them the proper help that they need. I uh, was there personally. I was there every day. I, I think all but one, I think I was actually in committee <laughs> or had some other state duties. I was there when they started to erect a fence around this courthouse property. Um, and a bunch of state police showed up to make sure things ran smoothly. Now, the fence was uh, getting set up at a very fast response. And as that was happening, um, the residents of this area were notified that their stuff um, was going to be thrown away um, if they could not move it in time. Um, they did not wait for the fence to be erected they um, immediately started throwing um, people's possessions away. And um, this was, this situation was ex extremely blown out due to the pandemic. So we have seen a major increase in uh, houseless people across the state and a lot in our city areas where uh, they can't, we can't afford apartments and um, landlords just, some of them just don't care and it is what it is. And so getting back to people congregating here, all their worldly possessions um, in one spot. Um, I remember speaking to one of the uh, women there, um, she, had medications, social security card, um, something from her grandmother. I mean, I'm talking about the last worldly possessions to her name in a backpack. Um, and while there was a couple of us um, there to bear witness and try to scramble and save as, as much of these belongings for people as possible, it was utter chaos. And there was a lack of dignity given to us by the police. Um, there was at least three to four officers standing near me. Um, we spread out to help each individual as much as we could. And I'm a five foot two woman. I don't have much upper body strength, but there was this cart that was really close to the people erecting this fence. And 
as these three huge, very strong men stood there and laughed at me. I scrambled to push this person's possessions to safety. And it was a lot. It was a tent. It was a lot of, a lot of weight and in a shopping cart. Um, it was a lot and I couldn't do it. And I fell over and they laughed at me and they said, you almost got it and you better hurry. And I wasn't not treated like a human being in that moment. And I can only imagine what the people that have fallen onto less fortunate circumstances must feel about being treated in that position. And I think that as a state, I'm really ashamed of how our officers acted in that moment. And I think there was a lack of response from our state and lack of resources and training our officers on how to handle this situation. And we need to address it. It's our responsibility to do that. It's just, it's, it's a situation where we put our police officers in that we don't have a system for, for them to be trained on. So how can we expect them to handle this with the dignity that people deserve? Maybe they were uncomfortable, who knows? Who can say? The whole experience was very traumatizing for everybody involved, especially the people that got their entire worldly possessions thrown away. And I just think that we need to make training available. We need to showcase this incident in particular for due process of people. What if you became homeless? What, what if you were in that situation? What are your rights? Um, how do, is, is it really quite necessary to throw away everything and incarcerate you on the taxpayer's money when maybe there should be mental health and substance use um, advocacy and resources for these people? How much money are we really spending by continuously incarcerating the homeless and not maybe putting money to another uh, resource that we can rehabilitate these people in? And that's what this bill is designed to do. We've heard continuous testimony in this committee already from the lack of data that our police officers in the state gather. And we are shooting ourselves in the foot here by, by, by not studying this and, and providing dignity and morality to this issue, which is increasing right now. It's, 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 it's an emergency. And I ask you to please take it with all due consideration that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Burt, you recognize for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for taking my question. Um, Representative, if I understood right and read the union leader correctly, um, on the state property of the courthouse, uh, Governor Sununu did offer them uh, some assistance in dairy, but I, I don't know everything on that. But what my question is, is Mayor, the Manchester Mayor Craig, uh, the man, you know, the Manchester Mayor, uh, is she having the police, the Manchester police, studied as they went on Mayor Craig's first day in office down on the riverbanks and removed all of the homeless off the riverbanks and forced them up on Elm Street and other parts of the city? Are they doing a you know a study? on the Manchester police, is the mayor doing that? I believe there's been more uh, calls for transparency on the Manchester police as well. And speaking to this incident in particular, this was a state police issue. So I'm just trying to focus on this. This is a state issue. The police in question that removed the homeless and threw away all their belongings were state police. The police that laughed and mocked me while I fell on the ground and hurt myself for at least three weeks because I've had at least two, three surgeries on my knee. They laughed at me, they humiliated me, they treated me less than human. And this is something that needs to be taken serious, the whole state, including all cities and towns. So if you're referring to an interest of doing this at the city level too, I completely agree with you, Representative. Thank you, 
Representative Hart, you were recognized for follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, thank you, Representative, for taking my follow-up question. If, if, if that happened, and, and I do believe you, um, you know, that's terrible that, you know, any officer would treat anybody, especially in that situation, because that's got to be hard on the homeless. You know, I, I, you know and, and again, I just go back to Manchester. Were you part of helping the homeless? And is Mayor Craig doing a study on the Manchester police when they went down under the Amoskeg Bridge just like a week ago? and forced everybody out onto the street again. Um, you know, I've been following uh, uh, Joe Kelly Lavasser, and he's posting these pictures that are just horrific in my eyes of what the mayor is instructing the police and the town officials or the uh, uh, Department of Public Works to remove in these homeless people. They got to live somewhere. And yes, I was just wondering if she was part of helping that. Yes, let me try and answer that. Thank you so much. As far as I know, Joe Kelly Lavasser has never really taken an interest in the homeless population. He's consistently worked against it. And if you have the time and you're interested in more information on this issue, I suggest that you start to attend some of the aldermen meetings where they are discussing this and they are gathering information. And I know they're doing everything in their power right now to get more data. As far as the state's concerned, I think that we continuously bury our heads in the sand and make excuses why we can't gather data. And that is why I think it's a state responsibility and a city responsibility. So I'm saying, yes, I agree with you, Representative. But I think we also need to make sure that this is conducted at the city level by passing this bill. Representative Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, bringing us back to the issue of, uh, of the police for just a second, uh, to what extent do you feel that it's, it's a complicating issue uh, for the police that a, a fair percentage of the people who are homeless um, have other problems like mental health issues? Does that compound the, the situation in your opinion? Uh, yes, it does. What I'm most concerned is that our taxpayers are continuously paying for people with mental health and substance use misuse disorders or others, a whole other slew of, of health issues. And what we're doing is instead of addressing those medical conditions or resources for assistance on living a life that doesn't include being homeless, uh, we instead we we instead spend that money on continuously inciting them, giving them um, fines, and then when they can't pay that, on, and compounding on top of that, then we incarcerate them. So we are literally paying for this problem to keep happening. Um, and in my uh, honest opinion, like I said, data is really important for us to make these good decisions on how to better operate our state and, and make sure that everybody's being treated fair and that we're not just hemorrhaging our taxpayers' money on, some, on a system that's not working. And, and I think we can all agree that no matter how you end up homeless or displaced, that you should be treated with some sort of dignity and I didn't see that. And I'm talking to you from a witness that was there and I had cops laugh at me. I was humiliated by our own state police. Thank you. Representative Testament. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question, Representative. Um, you keep talking about the state police as being the perpetrators. Uh, you're, but the bill says law enforcement. So I'm assuming you want all kinds of law enforcement uh, looked at in this. And also you say the criminal justice system. Uh, is that true? 
yes, just going back to what Representative Burt said, this is a necessary study committee to gather data so we're not wasting our taxpayers' money and we're not making lives worse. It is our responsibility as the Criminal Justice Committee of the state of New Hampshire to make sure our system is working for our taxpayers and for the purposes of correct rehabilitation. There is a major black hole here. I'm not asking for us to pass anything. I'm asking us to study things and to get data. Representative Hopper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. This doesn't seem to be a a situation that's unique to New Hampshire. Do you know if this has already been studied elsewhere? When you say it's not unique to New Hampshire, are you talking about other states? Um, can you please um, clarify? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair. Representative Hopper, please, can you may clarify for the witness. Um, uh, yes, Representative, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in other words, the homeless situation is not unique to New Hampshire. How to deal with it is also is likewise not unique to New Hampshire. Do you know of studies that have already been done around the country as to how uh, the most effective way to deal with the homeless situation? Yes, um, they have. There's a lot of other studies that have been done in um, communities with major displacement issues. And usually it's um, more, we have to offer more resources and we don't do that here. And I brought to this argument to the floor a lot and people just say, well, there's no proof. And it's a circular argument then. So if you're telling me that I can't get this data to prove to you that there's a need, then you're just not going to go for it. But then when I try to get data, you won't let me get data to prove that there is a need. So I think this is New Hampshire specific. I think that we don't operate just like every other state and that has been made by you as well. I've heard as your other testimony from my colleagues is that New Hampshire is unique. We need to do our own research and we need to hold ourselves accountable as leaders to make sure we're not wasting our taxpayers' monies and, and making people's lives worse. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, Representative Knight, you're excused. I want to thank you for your testimony. Before we, before we begin calling members of the public to testify, I want to remind the members of the public that for the purposes of this hearing, your testimony is limited to one minute, and one minute after one minute expires, you, your testimony will be suspended. Calling the first witness is Marina Schwarzen. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll try to keep this to one minute. Um, I think one really important thing is a lot of people have a question of this being a state problem versus a Manchester problem. Um, I was one of the protesters at the encampment occupation um, at 300 Chestnut Street. And one thing that was very clear there was that, and I have a fairly basic understanding of this, so maybe people can elaborate later. Um, a lot of the people who were there are from all over the state because our drug rehabilitation system specifically funnels people into Manchester and creates a crisis there. So this is something that is a statewide issue that kind of shows up in these sort of specific focal points. Um, so I think study, a statewide study is really warranted. And another thing, a lot of the people that I met there are really regular people. And for a lot of them, they became houseless very quickly. And it was very apparent to me that really any of us, no matter what our background is, are much closer than we think to being houseless. Ms. Schwarzer, I, I, I want to thank you for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. Calling the uh, next witness is 
Grace Lemay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Grace Lunny. I'm a student at Newmarket Junior Senior High School. Um, I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire High School Democrats. Um, the housing crisis in New Hampshire is one that should concern everyone. And in, New Ham in November 2020, a houseless encampment outside of the Manchester Courthouse was raided by the police department. In frigid temperatures, people's belongings were destroyed and some were forcefully removed by the police. Housing has still not been secured for them and the many other houseless Granite Staters. This heartbreaking instance of police brutality toward a group of people who were trying to find a place to stay warm and tense while temperatures dropped to freezing overnight demonstrates a clear need for the establishment of this committee to examine law enforcement and the criminal justice system's response to houselessness in New Hampshire. New Hampshire should protect and find housing for houseless people in the state and establishing this committee is an excellent first step in establishing a more just system. No one should have to worry about violence from the law enforcement, especially not when they are in a particularly vulnerable situation and trying to find a place to shelter. I urge members of this committee to support HB 286 and respectfully request that no questions be asked afterwards. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimonies. Uh, the chair recognizes Sophia Ford. Your testimony is limited to one minute. Oh, I see it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sophia Ford, and I'm a member of the public. Um, three months ago, I was at the courthouse in Manchester, New Hampshire, to protest the eviction of houseless residents on government property. It only took me one night in the freezing cold to see that we not only have a housing crisis in New Hampshire, but our government seems ill-equipped and unprepared to tackle the issue. When residents ask for mental health and substance use support, they are met with harassment and cruelty. And when residents ask for housing, dignity, and respect, they are met with violence. How can we address the problem if we don't even have the lens to look at it? I want you to imagine being in sub-degree weather in New Hampshire with nowhere to go, no warm bed to sleep in, and ask yourself how you would want to be treated by your government. Slapping a Band-Aid on the problem whenever New Hampshire gets bad press is not anywhere close to enough. We need to support our houseless neighbors, facilitated by research on the communities most affected. It doesn't take an expert to see that we have a housing crisis in New Hampshire and Bill 286 needs to be passed. So our elected officials. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Uh, your time has expired. Se seeing, no, seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. The chair now recognizes Rose Harmon. Now remind Ms. Harmon that your testimony is limited to one minute. Rose Harmon, Mr. Chairman, I don't see that name. Let me double check. I am not seeing that name, Mr. Chairman. We'll circle back to Ms. Harmon at the end. Stephen Kidder. Recognized by the chair, I will run by Mr. Kerry that your, your testimony is limited to one minute. Again, Mr. Chairman, I don't see Stephen. Uh, well, maybe if they could raise their hands, Mr. Chairman. If there's any members of the public who do wish to testify, please raise your hand at this time. Madison Egan. Yes, that's there. Hold on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, my name is Madison Egan. I'm a resident of Manchester. Um, I'm in support of this bill. 
Over the years, I've seen several instances of harassment of homeless folks, but the worst of all I've seen was during the eviction at the courthouse last November. I wish witnessed police officers slashing tents, throwing out people's belongings, and laughing while they did it. It was clear they took joy in this activity. It was not a glum occasion in which they simply had to do their jobs, but something they reveled in. I spoke to one resident who was still asleep in their tent when they began slashing the tents. She could have been injured. It is abundantly clear that there is a deep bias held towards the homeless community, and it absolutely has to be investigated. Thank you. Thank you for presenting your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. Nate Stewart, you're recognized by the chair, testified. Just as a reminder, your testimony is limited to one minute. Hi, um, that's not my name, but I was asked to unmute. I just want to check to make sure that I'm supposed to be speaking. It moved on me, Mr. Chair. I apologize. Um, I did click on the wrong one. And with all due respect, Ms. Perez, we do. Uh, I have a practice of saving the lobbies for last, but we have one list. We won't forget. So allow Nate. Nate, St Nate Stewart is recognized. Look. Hello. Um, so I was uh, also at the uh, camp uh, last year, uh, and I saw firsthand how the cops, like, uh, didn't handle the situation well at all. Uh, it led to a lot of harm against uh, homeless folks. Uh, and I'm here to speak in favor of the bill uh, in part because I believe uh, that uh, more uh, needs to be done about how we approach uh, homelessness in this state. I know in my own hometown of Dover, New Hampshire, our police chief has talked at length about how he feels that uh, the cops are unequipped to deal with uh, homelessness. And uh, so like, it's not just a bunch of, you know, activists calling for this research to be done. Cops also uh, feel like they're not equipped uh, to handle homelessness uh, in the same way that more uh, restorative methods would uh, allow. And a commission would allow uh, the state to look into alternatives that could work, not just for the state level state troopers, but for- Mr. Stewart, you, you, your time has expired. Seeing no hands raised, Witness is excused. Back to Stephen Kidder. He's still on. Mr. Chairman, I do not see Stephen Kidder. Rose Harmon. I am not seeing Mr. Uh, 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 Rose Harmon either, Mr. Chairman. This time the chair will recognize Erica Perez. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, so my name is Erica Perez. I'm with New Hampshire Youth Movement and I'm here to support um, HB 286. Um, I'm also one of the organizers who helped prevent the eviction at the encampment outside of the courthouse in November. Um, <clears throat> but I also personally, every Sunday, um, work at a free store that gives supplies directly to the houseless people. I talk directly with them. I consider a lot of them my friends. Um, five of them have died since November. Um, and New Hampshire, frankly, is doing a horrible job. We don't have a plan to deal with our homeless population. We treat them like pests. We actively incarcerate them. We act, we like kick them out of shelters. They have nowhere to go. They're kicked off of properties. Like there is literally no place for these people to go. There are no real resources for everybody. There are resources that come with conditions. Um, and that facility that you were talking about, Representative Burt in Derry was um, a sober house where you weren't even allowed to smoke cigarettes. Um, but essentially, 
it's just a study committee. I don't understand why it's so hard to want to investigate something that clearly needs investigating. We've been talking all year about racial bias training. This is similar. They are treated less than because they have nowhere to go. There are biases that we carry against houseless people. I actively help houseless people and I also actively have to work on my biases against houseless people because we have been raised to be taught that they are lazy or addicted to drugs Ms. Perez, your testimony has expired. Uh, you actually went up about 30 seconds over the committee testimony, so we do have to suspend. Representative Muse, you're recognized for a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to when it when it comes to the relationship uh, between houseless people and, and the police. I guess, can you speak a little more specifically to that and the things that, uh, that you see as maybe being things that a study committee could address? And you are on mute. Oh, we have to unmute the witness. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so for example, um, a lot of these folks do have substance abuse issues and instead um, of taking them somewhere where they can get help, they are immediately arrested if found with drugs. Um, I've spoken with people who have had their IDs claimed by the police and not given back. So now that person lacks identification. Um, they have their things confiscated. Um, and it just leads them to have less and less. Um, they are treated like criminals because they have nowhere to go. Um, and it just creates this repetitive cycle of um, being incarcerated, having nothing, and then being incarcerated again. Thank you. Is that Jeffrey, do you have a question? No, I'm sorry. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. I want to thank you for your Are there any members of the public who are in attendance that wish to testify that have not testified already? Please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised at this, at this time, the chair will close the public hearing on House Bill 286. And Mr. Chair, for House Bill uh, 286, we had 245 people who signed in in support of the bill. We had one person who signed in in opposition. Thank you, Representative. Thank you again, Representative Muse. At this time, here's an open the executive session on House Bill 125. It's the uh, 17th day of February, 2021, it is 11 20 a.m. Hearing this morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank The members, there's been two amendments. Uh, just I want to clarify before we begin. Do the members at home, do they have a copy of each amendment? And that would also apply to the members in the room. I only have one. One is by Representative Lori, one is by myself. I don't know. 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 I don
No, it's online. It's in the email, you know, the state rep email today. I don't get that. I don't get any of those comments. Uh, yeah, Karen sent uh, Karen sent the I just forward uh, Representative Roy's amendment uh, to the committee. Gary, could you bring me on of um, Davis's? I have to find it first. Oh, maybe Chris can help. Abbas's, uh, sure. Representative Abbas's uh, amendment. 84. Oh. Wait, I don't know. Get the crowd over there. Does anybody else need one from the, our chairman? Did the folks online, the virtuals, say they got it? Mm -hmm. They, they have it, but Representative True doesn't have a computer. He just represented Marston, so they don't have the. They wouldn't have the. He just represented Welsh, so we'll have the middle of all of those kind of things. There'll be some of the first kind of things. Yeah, it came in at eight o'clock this morning. From her, is that true? I was on the road. Yes, um, road I believe so. That's what that house will has. Well, no, you know what? The amendment has to be on the separate from the house. Computer, the best computer, ink supply. It's when it goes to the Senate. When it goes to the Senate, it will be whole. Whatever we pass in the house. I'm going to hold. So the house has to also yeah. 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 black and red, black and color, just like forty five dollars. Yeah, I don't know this uh the color. Yeah. I'm not burning through my two hundred dollars real quick. That's right now. I don't know that's a there's some of the some new potential So maybe it's not even new that has like a massive ink supply. I think it's cool. So what I always think that the ink that's in there is good, there. Is good for like five years. At this time, Representative Welch is recognized for a motion to block the task to offer an amendment. Oh. Is there a second? Second. That has been seconded by Representative True. The amendment is uh, 0384 H. To clarify that amendment, 0384 H. Just to explain, what, explain the uh, concept of the amendment, I understand that if this provision were to be violated or not, by some member of law enforcement. Although there may be a common law claim, there also may be issues of whether, um, is it, whether, whether immunity applies or not. I think the, certain, the concern here is that, I think, and we heard this expressed by Representative Knight, that it is a problem when, the, when a post arrest photo is simply distributed without any, any reason. That can ruin someone's life, uh, especially if that person is not convicted of any crime. What the amendment does is it actually creates a private right of action for the person who is aggravated by a law enforcement uh, failure to comply with the section and allow them to recover a statutory fee or actual damages in addition to their legal needs. I will say when it comes to proving your actual damages, you have to show some type of loss or damage. You know, damage to one's reputation is often hard to prove uh, in a court of law. So that 
five or slander, it's hard to prove how you've been injured by that act. So this puts some teeth behind the enforcement side of it. It also strikes one sentence from the original bill. Uh, the, the original bill did allow the photograph to be dispersed to the alleged victim in, in a, involving the crime. Although I, 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 I understand the reason for having a lot of the victims see the photograph. Once you at least disperse the photograph, you've now given the photo to the victim. The victim could essentially then put that photo on social media or online. So we really, that could in many circumstances defeat the purpose of what this bill I believe is trying to accomplish. It does not prevent the law enforcement from showing the photo to the victim. They, they just cannot hand or uh, provide a digital or physical copy of the photo. Uh, in addition, law enforcement is limited to only sharing it with other state or local law enforcement agencies. There wouldn't be, they're not allowed to provide to the federal government and allow them to disperse. And uh, I, I will say, I, I support this. I support this bill as an offer pass with an amendment. You know, a close friend of mine who I grew up with was uh, charged with a crime about 10 years ago. Uh, and the reason why he was arrested in were open about this that he simply wouldn't uh, speak to a DNA test. Well, he was arrested. His photograph was in the front page of the newspaper. Uh, since that time, his life has not been the same. To this day, if you Google his name, you will see a newspaper article and his mugshot. In the article, the police were very adamant celebrating that they, they caught their, their, their guy here which this case didn't even proceed down any meaningful discovery uh, due to the lack of evidence and the alleged victim recanted the allegation as well. However, it, it falls into this day. It's a very serious charge. And since that happened, he's been unable to hold the city job because everyone sees the photo. So someone who I know very well, who I grew up with, has been <coughs> suffer as a result of law enforcement dealings. There was no public interest in disclosing the photo, and uh, it's unfortunate that it happened. And back in the day, when people were in the courtroom, you know, they would have them wearing a you know, typical orange jumpsuit. They even get rid of that because it implies someone who did something wrong, or right? it's guilty of offense. I think we move past that in the courtroom, now they don't, they don't permit that. So I'll be supporting the motion by the task in the event. We'll now open up for discussion. Representative Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have, I think, a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, there's been some confusion about the amendments. I understand that your amendment is 85H, and I believe that Representative Roy's amendment was 84H. And the only reason I mentioned the difference between them, his had a penalty, yours has a penalty in it, and his does not. Um, is that a correct understanding? Well, I believe I'm just basing it on, I don't want to speak for Representative Roy, but I, I recall his testimony saying that but he didn't believe that the penalty needed to be put into the bill because it's a common law cause of action. Although that may be a correct statement, I still say that there may be some immunity issues there. Assuming there's not, you would have to prove your damages in order to recover. I will say it's very difficult to do that, but this allows is for a is your actual damages if you're able to prove it, or you would you would recover ten thousand dollars plus your legal fees on top of that if you're aggravated by this. So Representative Newman. Yes, just to follow up. So we are considering your amendment 85H and your amendment has a, a penalty in it. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. So the 10,000, who is the payback? Is that something that's going to end up filtering down to the city? The way the, way the event is written, it says the, the person. So it would actually be the officer. Whether that officer is identified or not is a matter of 
that's, that's his own legal issue. It's quite common that officers are identified, but it, at the same time, there are exceptions. But I will, I, I'm just, in my, I'm just gonna say my opinion, I, I, I would find it very difficult to actually buy it. You would have to take the mugshot and somehow probably this, this person. That, that would, to me, would be very so difficult mistake to make. I don't see anything here that talks to social media. Was that intentionally left out of it? Because remember, that's where this is the whole part of this came from social media. This person is this person. You know, whether you give it to a media outlet or whether you publicize it yourself on social media. I think it would apply to both. Any type of public disclosure of the post arrest photo is whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, or you give it to the you know the union leader. It doesn't say that. But this, this person is this person. I don't believe it needs to say specifically because then if you list social media and newspaper outlets, you're actually yeah, it could be interpreted as limited. You know, they're walking around, they posted you know, on, on a public billboard at the town hall. You know, it, that would be dispersing in my opinion, but you don't want you don't necessarily need to list every form of dispersing. Unless you're gonna leave something else. Right. Thank you. Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I find the article three, Roman numeral three, with the ten thousand dollar liability plus costs and legal fees, whichever is greater. But the point that there's that penalty, I find objectable. I find that I'm objecting to that part of this amendment, respectfully, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that this will cause people to, if this were to happen, file lawsuits. And it becomes a lot of that kind of tying up the court times, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't even have that right now, but because of the $10,000 penalty, I am going to vote no on the amendment. In terms of Marston, the only, the only, the only response to that would be is, if this is a law that we pass, it needs to, it needs to be an enforceability side. There's no penalty behind it. What's what's the benefit of the law? I I think we we all agree in this committee that this, the concept of this bill is a great great policy. But if there's no consequence for violating it, it's a retreat policy doesn't make any noise. Follow up, Representative Marston. Thank you. Could the amount be lowered to something in in the terms of even a thousand dollars? Well. Beauty of, the beauty of our role here is that we, I suppose we can, that can be a different amendment. I, I will say, in case of one of my friends, you know, in anonymous, $10,000 does not solve his problem. I'm just, this should not happen. And it, it's meant as a church. That's just my, that's just my take on it. If we, if we want, if, if we all believe this policy is to benefit people, protect their liberties, protect their rights, it needs to be a consequence of the rights of others. That's that's my. Opinion. That's not true. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have questions on on the amendment, but not now. But. A couple of people have mentioned that the uh, the, uh, the representative Abbas amendment is 3085. That amendment that, we, that has been offered now we're discussing is amendment 3084. No, 384, that's the amendment. Yes, 3085 doesn't exist, it hasn't been offered yet. So I'll wait. So I just want, some people said referred to your amendment as 85. I just want to clear that. Okay. Thank you. 3084 is the one we're discussing. Correct. Representative Knight, you are the prime sponsor. 
Am I allowed to talk about it in exec? Yes, I am, right? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm really conflicted. I don't like, who, I wanna know who's responsible for paying the 10,000. Is it the police department, the police officer personally? Um, like what, what is the procedure there? And do you, if we're gonna go that far and, and we acknowledge that mistakes can happen, do we wanna include then like a first for a second offense or like say like, you know, this is this, you didn't take this serious. Um, do we want to work on this more? Can we maybe have another amendment and pull it for right now? Representative, the response to that, I will say if it's if this was like clearly inadvertent, uh, by you know, to a negligent act by a police officer, uh, my understanding is at least at the state level, that that, that officer would be identified. I, I my understanding at the local level. It's common practice that if it's a negligent act, they would also be like a follow up, Chair. If it's done intentionally, then then that's where the issue of identification becomes. And so, oh, sorry. Meaning, if it's an intentional violation, I'm, I'm not as clear on whether you'll be identified or not. A simple, incidentally, you know, they leave, they leave a file out and, and you know, they lost it. That's amazing. And this only applies again with people who can arrest them, not they. I, I just, my concern is my taxpayers paying for a, a mistake that a police officer made or a police, like some one bad actor. You know, I don't, I don't think that's fair to my constituents. That's just what I want to make sure of. I'm a huge fan of the bill that you, you put in, I think, for putting it in. I just want to make sure that they have some enforceability behind it. The consequences are if it's not all. Thank you. I appreciate that. Representative Muse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Last year, when we heard testimony for this bill, um, you know, we actually heard some different perspectives. We, we heard from members of the news media uh, who were concerned. I, I believe we also heard uh, from some folks uh, representing police. I think Captain Joe Ebert from the, the state police testified. And one of the things I think that he, that he told us so that I remember him telling us at the time was that um, violation of this could also be a disciplinary issue that would involve, uh, that could potentially involve discipline from the police uh, standards uh, and training council. Um, like other violations uh, that, uh, that police are case occasionally accused of. Um, I, I guess my question is, is that the $10,000 uh, civil damages for someone on a policeman's salary seems to be very, very high. Um, it would also, seem to be a motive, something that would motivate me as a police officer to uh, not mess around with this particular statute if I knew that I could be dragged up before a disciplinary hearing uh, and potentially be suspended uh, or maybe even lose my certification. So I'm just wondering if, if, uh, if this is really necessary. I guess that's my question. I, I will... I mean, necessary is a strong word. I still think that if you have any law or policy that has no enforcement mechanism behind it, I understand that maybe an internal discipline, discipline action, but I, I think it's critical that it, in order to deter this activity, that we deter other activities with penalties of crime. There needs to be some, some provision here because people are injured and damaged by this when they have. And they can be. And if we're serious about stopping it, I, I believe that we need to have a some balls. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to oppose this amendment. Um, I think the penalty uh, makes uh, the law a little murky. I think more important is the policy. And I think that if we uh, Im include the penalty into this uh, bill, uh, it's very li likely uh, to uh, go down in flames.
Representative Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support the amendment that's brought forward, the uh, 0384 amendment, uh, because I like the, the small penalty there, um, because there has to be deterrence. You know, because in my eyes, you know, it's extremely rare that I think they do that. But, you know, if they arrest somebody on a charge and the person being arrested is not a happy person and causes trouble, you know, I think sometimes they throw it out on social media to say, okay, here you go. They throw it out there. Um, this will slow that behavior down because our police cannot be the judge and jury. And this will slow that down to, uh, to embarrass him or her. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in support of it. And I don't think this is going to clog the court system. You know, as my friend uh, representative said uh, from Manchester that it would. And the reason I feel that is I don't think this happens a lot. So the rare times it does happen, it gives the person that's just being charged an avenue to recover some cost that he's incurred. Uh, during that time, and then later, all the charges are probably dropped. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have questions on the amendment. Uh, the way I read the amendment, basically, the amendment becomes the bill. Um, and so I'm trying to decide, trying to see where the changes are. I, True. So line on, on the original bill lines 12 and 15, that one sentence uh, was changed and then the, the penalty provision was added. Otherwise, the rest of the bill as filed is the same. Thank you. See no further hands up. The clerk will call the roll. The motion is on the amendment. Let's, let's do it on the amendment. Vice, for, the at, for the folks at home, turn the camera on. Vice Chairman Welch? Yes. Representative Burke? Yes. Representative Hopper? Yes. Representative Green? Yes. Representative Wallace? Yes. Representative Testament? Yes. Representative True? Yes. Representative Pratt? Yes. Representative Marston? With full respect noted, no. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathright? No. Representative Pantalakis? No. Representative O'Hearn? No. Representative Gordon A. No. Representative Muse. No. Representative Newman. No. Representative Bolden. No. Representative Conley. No. Representative Klein Knight. No. Representative Bradley. No. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. To my a vote of 10 yeas, 11 nays, the amendment fails. So the motion now is about to pass. Representative Knight, you're right, I make a motion to bring forth the other amendment from Representative Roy. It, it's right now the motion is about to pass. Okay. From the original bill. What the hell? Representative Gordon, do you recognize to discuss the motion about to pass? Uh, I am not quite sure of the procedure on this on this particular uh, session. Uh, I think that we can offer a, an amendment at this point uh, 
and I would like to do so. You have to recognize the officer. Mr. Chairman, a point of order. You've been recognized, Representative Meehan. Point of order. My point of order is that the last amendment, to my best of my knowledge, passed. Is that correct? No. No, no. 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 Okay. no. Okay. I withdraw. I withdraw that. That is not a point of order. That is a question. See, a point of order is when you're questioning whether the chair of the committee is following parliamentary procedure or the rules correct. If that isn't what a point of order is, if you have a question of the chair, please raise your hand. Be, you will be recognized for a question. A point of order, the chair must interrupt everything that's going on and recognize the point of order. You're out of order. Your point of order is out of order. Thank you for that information, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the future, I'll try and raise it as a parliamentary inquiry. I think that may be correct. Representative Voss, do you wish to speak on the motion? I do have a question. So, are you saying that we, we can't do another amendment? Well, the motion's on the floor of our pass. Yeah, members. Harry is not a member of the committee. Only a committee member. Right. And I think that's what a committee member wanted to do. Also, <clears throat> that's the question. So you're asking the representative Gordon wants to offer the other. I think he has a totally different amendment. Where is it? Representative Borney, do you have an amendment that is you wish to offer that's that's ready to be offered? <coughs> yes, I do. And is that the can you read the number of that? Uh, th this is amendment offered by Representative Roy, um, uh, 2021 dash uh, 385 H. Uh, I have forwarded a copy to uh, the committee. It basically clarifies. Uh, uh, the process and it does not offer a uh, a, a penalty. So you wish to offer you wish to offer that amendment. Yes, I do. Representative Boyd, you you recognize to offer the amendment. Is there a second? <laughs> I'll second. Second. Representative Newman, you seconded. That's correct. We should speak on the amendment. Um, I really basically have nothing more to offer than what Representative Roy uh, provided in his testimony. Um, uh, it is uh, it does improve the uh, bill as originally presented, and um, I encourage you to adopt the amendment and uh, pass the bill as amended. Representative O'Hearn. Uh, question for the chair, and maybe I'm a little confused. I thought that the only amendments that could be presented to the committee has to be coming from a committee member, not uh, from a other representative outside the committee. So you are correct. What, although the, the amendment uh, was brought by Representative Roy, uh, I believe Representative Borne has now offered the amendment. Uh, so the, the amendment is still being offered by a member of the committee. Uh, and then now a second. I believe that, that that is in order. I, I will say it is, it's my opinion, better practice to have a member of the committee's name on the amendment, but I don't believe that that's necessary. I, I, you may be mistaken. Am I mistaken? You may be mistaken. Where was You raised my point of order. Yes, I am. My understanding, and I may be wrong, but when we get an amendment, who has the name on it and they have the number. The name is not a number of the committee. You can't use that. It has to be redrafted. The committee number is not enough. I would suggest that we recess this until the proper number can be run forward. 
I would agree with uh, Representative uh, Welch. What I'll do is get clarification on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the 11 years I've been here, uh, we have agreed as a committee that we like, let's say if this amendment passed, um, I have seen this in the past and we have agreed, okay, we will make sure that the name is changed. And as long as the name is changed um, to a committee member, we're going to adopt the committee or, or the amendment or deny the amendment on depending on how the vote is. Uh, we have done that in the past what, to, to save time. What, what, I'm, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm gonna recommend we do because we are running, we, we do have a public hearing that we should start. Sorry. Board While we're in that public hearing though, I, I we do have a job assignment. I would recommend that you add your name to that amendment so we can make this question uh, moot. Uh, so what I would recommend is uh, just ask the legislative services to add, whether it's a new number or not, add your name to that amendment and we'll reopen this executive session uh, today. And then also, if you don't mind, uh, to forward the amendment to, to the committee assistance to print out the members in the room. We have three members in the room physically with no computer to look at the members online. So at this time, at this time, we're gonna, the executive session on House Bill 125 will be in recess. <coughs> And then this time we're going to open the, the chair will open the public hearing on House Bill 485. And I'll be recognizing a very familiar representative who probably would love to talk earlier. I heard Senator Roy offer his bill. And Representative Roy, despite the temptation, he's going to speak on House Bill 485. He's there. Representative Roy, you recognize? Mr. Chairman, he is unmuted. <clears throat> there he is. Representative Roy, can you hear us? Oh. He keeps going back to mute and unmute. Representative Roy, can you hear us? <laughs> he says he can hear you. We can't hear you. Okay, how about that? Try that, Representative Roy. No, we can't hear you. Oh, he's unmuted again. He's got a hand up. I'm on. You know, he, he's unmuted. Um, it's showing you're unmuted. I could promote him to panelists. Maybe it's his software. Yeah, you should just do that, and then you can remove it after he's done giving testimony. Right, Representative Roy. No. All right, Representative Roy. So while Representative Roy feels a type of difficult use, which we're no stranger to in this room. Uh, with Representative, Representative Knight or Representative Holden, I, I believe each of you are uh, co-sponsors of the bill. Would one of you mind just introducing the bill? Uh, so we can call other witnesses just to get introduce it. And while we're the rest of the as soon as we get you, yourself figured out, we will allow you to return to the testimony. Yeah. Testimony to this bill is going to be limited to two minutes uh, per witness, and questions will be limited to 
Uh, each member of the committee is limited to two questions per week. Representative Bolden, you, your hand is raised. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to let you know I am not a co sponsor on this bill. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Representative Knight, would you mind? This is Representative Roy. Can you hear me? Oh, here he is. <laughs> so just in time, you saved me. Yeah, I apologize. I had to step on my headphones. They're not working anymore. Okay, so uh, let me just start again. Um, thank you for hearing this bill. I apologize for the, uh, the morass I launched you in on the last bill with my amendment, but this bill, um, this bill that we're gonna talk about now is regarding um, consensual searches. And I'd like to start by saying, this is, a, this is a conservative bill. This is a liberal bill. This is a libertarian bill. This is a educational bill. Um, when most of us were growing up, we had a class in school called civics. And in our civics class, they taught you how to interact with law enforcement, what your rights were and things of this nature. Um, I, I feel that that's not quite as uh, robust as it once was. So what this bill would do, similar to, but different than Miranda warnings police officers give, this would be a police officer in New Hampshire. If they were so inclined to search a vehicle, they would ask permission to search the vehicle. And when they do, they would inform the citizen that they have the right to decline such a search. Um, now, it, it may sound complicated, it's very simple. I'll walk you through an example. Um, a police officer sees a vehicle leaving the area where there's known drug activity. Um, he knows the owner of the vehicle, has a history of drug convictions, but he doesn't see enough to establish probable cause. Probable cause, he would not need consent to search the vehicle. So he does a, a he follows the vehicle, it has a taillight out, he speeds, he does a, a, a stop and addresses and speaks to the operator and asks the operator how he's doing, um, what have you been up to tonight? I saw you at that place. Um, do you have any drugs in the vehicle or anything I need to worry about? And the person would most likely say no. And at this point, the officer would say, well, then you wouldn't mind if I take a look, would you? Now, the average citizen, when they're asked that question by a police officer, feels intimidated. They feel like, well, if I say no, I'm going to look guilty. All the officer has to do at that point is to say, well, you don't mind if I take a look, do you? I mean, you don't have to let me look. You have the right not to. But that's all. That's all we're asking that they inform the citizen that they have a right to decline the search. Um, so as I said at the beginning, this is an education bill, um, civics. All we're doing is making the police let people know they have the right to refuse the search. And I'd be happy to take any questions with that. Representative Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Roy, for taking my question. In the case that you just described, where the citizen, um, where it, the police officer, if he did have probable enough to establish probable cause, how would that how would that transaction transpire differently? Uh, thank you for the question, Representative. The police officer has probable cause to search a vehicle um, or a person. He can stop. He can effectuate the stop. And he, he's allowed with probable cause for, for a vehicle. There's two ways it can go. Um, and, and again, I've been out of the, out of the, uh, out of the game for quite some time, but my recollection is because a vehicle is high, inherently mobile and evidence could be moved. The oper officer can search the vehicle using probable cause that he can articulate he has, or he can seize the vehicle until he can obtain a search warrant from a judge. Um, so let's say in that situation, he went with a search warrant option, he has probable cause, he could seize the vehicle, remove the operator from the vehicle. The operator, of course, is free to leave unless he's seized as well. Um, and the they would obtain a search warrant and search the vehicle. Or he could use probable cause to search a warrantless search of the vehicle. Um, many departments may offer the, the, uh, the warrant aspect, it just depends on the situation. Representative Newman. Just a quick follow-up. So then, I mean, we're talking about giving information to the citizen. He probably would, would tell him that at the point that he is taking whatever action he takes, 
it is not consensual because people by then would, everyone would know based on this law that it, you have the right to refuse uh, non-consensual -cons search. Is that correct? Um, I, I would say in my experience, no, um, it would not be correct. Um, you'd be shocked at how many people um, tell you now that you can search the car, even though they don't, they aren't warned that they have a right not to. Um, people know there's drugs in the car, know the police are gonna search it. And the police officer asks, may I search your vehicle? Even though he didn't say, you have a right to say no, implied in the question, may I search, is, uh, is the ability to say no to that search. But they say yes anyway, hoping that if they say yes, the search won't happen or the police officer won't find it, um, what have you. So I, I would say no, that most people still will not say no. Most people don't, I mean, you can say no to a field sobriety test, but people take it anyway, knowing they're gonna fail because they feel like if they say no, it makes them look guilty. It's, it's an interesting uh, study in, in psychology. Thank you. Representative Newman. Well, I just said thank you. Representative, I mean, sorry, Representative Hughes. Thank you. Um, I just had one question. I, I, I know that this bill has been compared in some ways uh, to the Miranda warning. Um, and the language for the Miranda warning is, is fairly, uh, fairly formal. Um, I'm not a police officer, but it seems like every police drama I've ever seen on TV, uh, they say it pretty much the same way. And, and I'm curious if you think that there, there may be some room for some ambiguity or for misinterpretation if this uh, isn't communicated uh, to people in a way that maybe is a little more standard and formal. Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Muse. And, and it's possible that maybe the difference between Miranda and this is a couple things. Miranda requires in, uh, custodial interrogation. That means that the person has to be in custody. So a, a lot of clever police officers will conduct investigations in a public place. So the person can never claim they're in custody and don't require the Miranda warnings. The Miranda warnings themselves um, came from the Supreme Court. Um, and they said what had to be, had to be, um, had to be said and implied in the warnings. This coming from the legislature is, is a lot different. Um, so we, we're free to, to say, you know, we could, we could spell out exactly what they have to say. We could create a form they have to use, but I don't want to hamstring the police entirely because a lot of good police work does come from gut instincts and them being able to ask a citizen, do you mind if I search? And them saying, no, you know, I, I don't think so. Or, you know, as long as the police officer tells them they don't have to, I think that we've, we've served our obligation to our citizens while at the same time not hamstring our police officers from being able to do good investigative work. Thank you. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Roy. If the person consented to have their car uh, inspected, uh, how far would the officer go uh, before he started dismantling everything in the car? Um, that's a good question. I would, I would suggest, um, based on common sense, a roadside stop, a consensual search isn't going to get into taking, taking, um, taking apart the vehicle. Um, they wouldn't have the ability, the tools or whatever to do that. Um, again, there, there is some, some ambiguity in that. The citizen's free to stop the search at any time and say, you know what, I withdraw my consent when they start pulling the seat cushions off, if, if that's the issue. Um, it, it's really between the citizen and the uh, police officer, how far that the citizens were willing to let it go. Thank you. Representative Wright, I thank you for your testimony. The chair uh, would ask a question of the witness, and I want to thank you in advance for taking my question. Uh, I, 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 I support the concept of, of this bill. What I, what I would ask, in, in a circumstance where an officer fails to comply with the requirements uh, of, this, of this bill, of this law, um, 
Would you support an amendment that would make, basically as a matter of law, make that search be done without consent, unconsensual search? I would, I just, I would be interested in the mechanism you would use to do that. I mean, currently there are consensual searches happening all around the country and questions of credibility, as you well know, come up in court as to if a, if a citizen says, hey, I did not consent to that search and the police officer says, yes, I did. It comes down to a question of credibility. I, I would think the only way to alleviate that would be some type of a, a signed document to allow the search. The only concern I have with that is once you get people signing things, um, it, it, it raises the bar so high that most people are, are they're gonna, you're gonna hamstring the police from the ability to, to use this consensual search tool um, once you start producing documents to be signed. It's kind of like the, um, it's kind of like with the, with the breathalyzer, you know, when you get to that part, portion of it and it, it, gets, it, gets a, uh, it gets official, that's when you get more refusals than you do for field sobriety tests, for example. And a citizen can refuse both of those. But generally, they take the field sobriety test, but the breathalyzer is where they'll they'll suddenly wake up and realize what's happening. So I, I'm trying to walk up as fine a line as possible by not hamstringing the police, but yet notifying them. So, I mean, I would be open to any amendment um, short of making something where the citizens had to sign permission, because I feel like that would definitely complicate the police officer's job a lot more. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for taking my question, Representative. Do you think, based off of what you just said, uh, we're discussing how to prove if your rights have actually been given to you. Do you think in this instance, it would be beneficial for our state to have body cams on our police officers? Um, well, I, I'm not sure how, how germane it is to, to the bill, but yes, I, I've always been a proponent of body camps. They're, they're good for the police and for the citizens. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely would think that it would be helpful because that would take away any questions of whether or not consent was given or not given. Thank you. Representative True. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question, Representative. Uh, I, was, I didn't quite understand. Uh, I know we we're talking about things that don't exist yet. You, I think you said you were against having the, the police have the, uh, people sign a form because it might hamstring the police. But isn't the whole purpose of your bill to make sure people are fully informed that, that they do not have to allow the police to search their, their car. Thanks for the question, Representative True. And, and, and I agree that there is, um, there, there is some inherent conflict in the two. I mean, I guess I would say that, you know, we, we could also say that they have a right to an attorney before they speak to a, a, a police officer at all. And I'm sure the chairman would tell you that they would say, don't talk to them about anything. So uh, uh, we have to make an assumption that, that citizens are, are, once they've been warned, they don't have to submit to the search, are, are wise enough to make their own decision, um, whether or not they wish to go further with that. Um, but as with Miranda, um, I don't, I'm not sure it's required, but a lot of places use a Miranda card where they ask the the person to sign their rights um, and it's in a much more solemn and controlled setting on the side of a highway at nighttime asking someone to sign a document um, I, I just feel it gets very complicated it, it, um, it you could almost get into whether or not you know was he did he feel like he had to sign the document so he could leave so then the document has to have a warning that you don't have to sign this document it just it creates a whole legal legal morass that we could get pulled into um, while it get decided in the court. Whereas if we simply say the police officer has to verbally warn the person, they have a right to refuse the search. Um, I think it, it's much less um, complicated. But I do agree with you, Representative Truitz. When balancing rights like this, it's, a, it's often a razor's edge we're walking on. Thank you. 
Seeing no hands raised, I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Professor Vice Shear, you're recognized. Who was that, Mr. Chairman? Professor Shear. Whoops, I'm in the wrong screen, sorry. Uh, can people hear me now? And Professor, we are uh, limiting testimony to two minutes per, per witness. Uh, I'm just going to get wound up at two minute time, but uh, I, I will abide by that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, my name's Albert Scher, often known as Buzz. Um, I've been a, a professor at UNH Law for 27 or 28 years. Prior to that, uh, I was a public defender in New Hampshire for 30 years. So I've been involved in the uh, criminal justice system in New Hampshire for about 40 years now. I teach in the area relevant to this uh, 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 HB 485, I teach in the area of criminal procedure, which this directly involves. Um, uh, let me make uh, uh, and one more thing. Uh, the opinions I express today are my opinions and not the opinions of UNH law or UNH proper. Uh, so this is what I would call Miranda light. Uh, it doesn't have the intense formality that uh, Miranda does, uh, given the circumstances, though stressful for for example, the driver of a car, very stressful. It, it, it's not compared to the stress that one undergoes when one is undergoing con, uh, custodial interrogation. The impor it's important to understand this bill does not create any new rights. The right to refuse to consent to a search, it, you have that constitutional right. All this bill does is notify the uh, the individual that they have that right. Uh, I think the huge majority of individuals don't know they have that right. Uh, I think uh, Representative Roy is right that most people will still go ahead and consent. There was a study done, as my written testimony reflects, that uh, uh, a, a mock, you know, situation, uh, unfortunately, by academics. Don't hold that against the study, uh, but they, they tried out uh, whether people would be more inclined to refuse to consent if they were told they had the right to consent. And the study sound, found no difference in the rate at which people refuse to consent. More fundamentally, Miranda itself, a study was done in 1999 that showed that after people are re read their Miranda rights, almost 90% of them waived their Miranda rights. So this is not going to be a big imposition. Uh, there are six states currently who have either by court, uh, uh, court decision or by statute have a provision similar to this. Uh, there are any number of municipalities in North Carolina, uh, in Kentucky, the state of Mississippi, the state of Arkansas, uh, their Supreme Courts have both found that there is a right that they have to be told that there is a right to refuse. The, uh, the town of Wentworth, New Hampshire has in their consent search form uh, language that says you have a right to refuse. Here, uh, you go going up so 40, 25 seconds over the time limit. I will uh, silence myself and uh, answer any questions that anyone has. You got lucky, Mr. Sheep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, fortunately, I'm remote, so you can't physically punish me. <laughs> uh, Representative Gaffer, you recognize for a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, you said there's a town that they actually have a form that- yeah, uh, most, uh, thank you for your question, Representative Gaffer. Most, uh, most towns in, virtually every town in New Hampshire has a consent to search form. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's not unusual that they, a town has a form that has a consent to search on it. Uh, Many of them do not include a right to refuse to consent in that form, but the, the town of Wentworth, New Hampshire does, um, and uh, the, the Bureau of Highway Patrol Enforcement in New Hampshire, uh, they also inform individuals of their right to refuse. So uh, it's not going to be a big change for police departments in New Hampshire. And in fact, well, I'll leave it at that. Representative Gaffrey, do you recognize for a follow-up question? Okay, so is this form something that um, 
the person that stock signs or what's just read to them and it depends on the police department um but you know the 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 attorney general's office law enforcement manual makes it clear that although not required at this point to inform somebody of their right to refuse uh, let me read what they say in the law enforcement manual Police officers are not obligated to inform people that they have a right to refuse consent. However, the New Hampshire Supreme Court has stated that it is good policy to do so. And in some situations, such as a knock and talk procedure, the court has considered requiring it as a prerequisite to valid consent. That a person was informed of the right to refuse before giving consent would be an important factor in a favor of a finding of voluntariness. So the, you know, the, the more documentation, the, the better. Um, I appreciate Representative Roy's comments um, about uh, documentation being perhaps being an impediment and I understand that. But certainly the, the Attorney General's law enforcement manual is very encouraging if police uh, of, of informing people of their right to refuse and you know, it would not be a big burden on any police department to change uh, to create a form or to change their form to include that right to refuse. See, seeing no hands raised, with his excuse, I want to thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. Joseph Ebert, now just as a reminder, your testimony is linked to two minutes. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joe Ebert. It's E-B-E-R-T. I'm a captain with the New Hampshire State Police overseeing the Investigative Services Bureau. Um, so uh, today I, I did want to uh, recognize uh, the testimony that I listened to from Representative Roy. I think uh, this is a very reasonable bill uh, to to make that notification to persons uh, is something that the, the state police uh, would encourage and, and would support. Uh, there is one portion of the bill that I had concern with, uh, that the Division of State Police had concern with as we reviewed it, and that is the um, uh, section that talks about omitting uh, that the person refused a, a consent search within an affidavit that's submitted later for um, for an, uh, a search warrant. So the concern we have there is one really just of uh, uh, more procedure than anything. I understand what the representative, or I think I understand what the representative was getting at there, that it shouldn't be used as a basis to build uh, probable cause. However, it is a fact that uh, took place and I would be concerned if we were omitting any facts uh, as we were submitting an affidavit to the, uh, to the judge. I think it's incumbent upon the judge to uh, give weight to that whatever fact is laid before them. Uh, so that's, that's really the only issue that, um, uh, that we had that we wanted to bring to the, um, to the conscience of the committee. And, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, should you have them. Seeing no hands raised, uh, Mr. Ebert, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes Melissa Davis. Can so, you? Your testimony is limited to two minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, so my name is Melissa Davis, and I'm here to testify on the behalf of the uh, Board of Directors for the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers in support of this bill. I've practiced uh, criminal defense law in New Hampshire for over 15 years, first as a public defender, and I'm now the director of the Criminal Pac Practice Clinic at UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. The statements I make today are in my own capacity and, and not representative of the UNH Law School or UNH itself, but I am speaking for the NHA CDL board. Um, you know, I do agree with that with what others have said today and that essentially this 
um, bill does not change the law. It does not, um, you know, give anyone more rights than they already have. It simply informs them of the rights that they have um, and lets them know that um, should they choose to exercise those rights, um, that they will, uh, that, that the choice to exercise those rights is not going to be used against them. Um, you know, I did submit written testimony on this and my experience is that, you know, anyone um, in this situation, you, me, um, anyone uh, who is pulled over on the side of the road and you know, confronting a police officer um, who is perhaps looking into whether or not they did something wrong um, is put in a position of sort of, um, being kind of under the microscope, under under sort of uh, the gun at that point to feel that you know they need to you know cooperate and comply, otherwise um, you know something bad might happen to them, and that includes making the choice to exercise their rights. But you know this bill would interrupt that and tell them that you know if they were. Uh, that one, it would inform them of their right, and two, it would tell them that you know if they um, chose to exercise that right, that it would not be um, used against them and would allow them to make a free choice in that moment. Um, you know, I think right now I can tell you, I think someone raised a question earlier about, you know, Miranda rights, and obviously that is a more formal process, but once advised of those rights, given the opportunity to um, review them, think about them, I would say, you know, it is most um, lawyers would tell you that uh, the majority of people are signing, you know, they're making these choices, but they're doing it in this moment that is, you know, kind of free from uh, kind of the pressure of answering, you know, in that moment and instead being able to reflect upon their rights um, as read to them, um, being advised that they have agency and choice in that moment. Um, I think it, it would probably result in a similar situation on the side of the road, um, with these drivers, but what this would do is change the nature into the of that encounter into one where the individual, you know, can make an informed choice. And you know, should they refuse to grant that consent, the officer is still free to use the evidence that he has. Attorney Davis, would you like to limit testimony to two minutes? You almost went, almost went to three minutes. So I apologize. Sorry, I wasn't with the stopwatch, but thank you for letting me know. It, it, it's no problem. I, the, the chair side of one would thank you for your testimony. I, I do also have a question and, and I would thank you in advance for taking my connection. I guess I, I support the policy that, that HB 485 was created. What, I, what I'm wondering is in, in a circumstance where an officer didn't comply with their uh, this policy that would be they didn't advise an individual of their right um, to not that they don't have to consent to the search. What what would be the consequence of that search? I understand if assuming there was no other basis for the search. So you're saying that if if the officer failed to abide by this law, should it go into effect? And so failed to uh, advise an individual of their right to refuse to consent, what would the consequence be? Yes. I think under the bill is as currently written. I don't think there's anything in in this bill itself that um, gives consequence to that. I think in the courtroom, um, the argument over whether or not consent was voluntarily given at that point would begin. And, um, you know, it, it would sort of uh, fall to, I think, the uh, parties to argue whether that consent was freely given in that moment um, and what the testimony was about the nature of the encounter. Thank you for taking my question. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, we uh. In I, I, although it's, I mean, really, it's a reminder myself that the testimony is two minutes, but the last two witnesses went over two, so I will allow you two and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Um, 
Thank you, Chair and Committee, for taking my testimony. My name is Joseph Lascaz. I am testifying today on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of New Hampshire, and we are in support of this legislation. Um, the first thing that I just wanted to start off uh, saying about this bill is that this bill is not going to create a new right. Um, all it does is just requires that police officers inform individuals of a pre-existing right. And it's, it's funny because when I first heard about this bill, I did a quick poll of um, you know, the individuals I knew whether or not they, they knew that they had the right to, uh, to refuse a search. And they did not, most people did not know. And I, you know, I don't know, you know, the majority of New Hampshire, but you know, pretty much everyone I knew didn't know this. And the, the other thing is that individuals, uh, one person responded to me that they had a situation where um, they were pulled over and the, the police officers thought that they were doing something wrong and, and told them, you know, well, if you have nothing to hide, then, I, then you should let me search your car, your vehicle. And they did because they felt like I need to prove that I have nothing to hide. And that, um, I, I think that's the problem. And that's what this bill is, is aimed at correcting is just making sure that individuals are informed about their rights and that they're making an informed um, decision. And, and like Representative Roy said, I don't think it could have been said better. This is really just about civics here. This is about just making sure that people know their right here in the Granite State, that they have, a, um, you know, that, that informed consent and that they're giving it and that they have a positive interaction with law enforcement. So it's for these reasons and those that have been stated before um, that we strongly support this legislation and hope that this committee votes ought to pass on this. I am happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Under two and a half minutes. I would say you were under two minutes. I was a couple seconds late. I represent it true. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, realizing that if, if it's uh, if the officer has a uh, uh, probable cause, none of this matters. But the way the bill is written, do you see any problem with it just falling back to he said, she said, the officer searches your car and you say, well, I never gave him permission. And he says, yeah. Yeah, he did give me permission. You see a problem with that? I do. Uh, I do see a problem with that. Um, as someone who has gone through the criminal justice system um, and seen many individuals go through the criminal justice system, it does. It does create a frustration um, on the individual's part when they feel as if, well, when they find out that they had a right that was never. Um, exercise or that they did exercise a right and it's not being recognized, that, that can provide um, complications, especially when trying to sort out a case um, in the courts. Uh, but as we heard that the courts would, um, you know, the judge would then start making that determination um, then, but that can be a problem. I do see that as a problem. Thank you. Seeing no hands raised, I want to thank the witness for his time and his testimony. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify that are present that have not already testified? If, if so, please raise your hand. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. So uh, again, my name is Esma Alhini. Um, I'm calling in because I support this bill uh, because police have an, a certain kind of authority within our community. Um, people will oftentimes just do as they're told. And so if they're even being asked the question, uh, it'll be thought of as mandatory versus a choice that they can actually refuse. Um, I can tell you as well as someone who's done several Know Your Rights presentations in the Upper Valley um, with a lawyer, most people had no idea that they can actually um, refuse a search. Um, so why is this important? Because studies show over and over again that people get racially profiled who've done nothing that warrants a search. So for example, um, if an officer stops someone for a traffic violation, 
Um, but because of what we know happens oftentimes to people of color at a much higher rate, they're also asked if a police officer can search their car. Um, so yeah, this is not going to stop racial profiling. I'm not going to say that um, this will end it, but it can and it does help people know that they at least have a choice versus they must just accept. So this is a step in the right direction, in my opinion. Um, yeah, and so I think this is good for our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. See, seeing no hands raised, uh, the witness is excused. Mr. Anthony Harris, your record. Hello, how are everybody doing this afternoon? My name is Anthony Harris. Um, I support this bill. I feel like, um, you know, there was once upon a time, um, I wrote on the other side of the law, you know, that was my past life. And there's, uh, I've gotten pulled over a couple of times and I didn't know that it was my right um, to deny a uh, consensual um, a search of my vehicle. And um, the last time I was, I was pulled over because my plates, um, my plates were out of date. So he had a right to pull me over. Um, and then he asked me if I had any drugs and I told him no. And he's, he asked me to search my vehicle. And I said, for what? Because I don't have any drugs. You pulled me over for this, for this particular reason. And he told me um, that if I didn't let him search my car, he was just going to call another officer, a canine officer, and um, have the dogs come around my car. There was, um, he had no reason to do that. And I feel like um, um, there's a lot of racial profiling. And as, as um, Esma just said, you know, I don't feel like this bill will stop the, um, the, the racial profiling, but at least it gives, it gives the citizens in the community um, an understanding of what their rights are. Thank you, Mr. Harris, for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. Say it again, if there's any members of the public who wish to testify that have not testified already, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised at this time, we will close the public hearing on House Bill 485. At this time, we will be uh, we will be in recess to one o'clock. Mr. Chair, on uh, on House Bill 485, we had 96 people signing in in support. Uh, two in opposition and one signing in as neutral. Let's, let's make that in recess to, to yes, we're in recess to one o'clock. Thank you, Representative Mew. Do you plan on exactly anything? I can. I have time to eat 12 have cupcakes. Just tell them what you want to be exactly.
The people that work in our newspaper only can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. All right. At this time, the chair, we're going to open up. We're going to open the executive session on House Bill 286, on the 17th day of February 2021 at 11 11 p.m. The chair is recognizing Representative Gap right to make a motion. Oh, oh, excuse me, one, 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 eleven. Excuse me. Here, we're going to the gap right now. Um, I move back to pass for House Bill 286. Um, it is definitely needed in the state of New Hampshire. So, so, well, I appreciate your enthusiasm. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. That is seconded by Representative Welch. Representative Gap, I would wish to speak to your motion. Oh, sorry. I no just problem. wanted to say that, um, first of all, I want to uh, thank Representative Pine Knight for bringing it forth. And um, I truly believe that this might help some of the conditions that we have with the homeless. And as everybody knows, especially the largest cities, we really do have a problem. So hopefully a committee can come up with some data or some information that can help the state going forward with the homeless issues. That's it. Seeing Representative Fessler. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to make a comment. I, I, I told you about 10 years ago or less. I, I spent two years, my company sent me out to Seattle for two years. And, and that was a beautiful city. A little bit of homeless, but it was really a beautiful city. There's a, there's a movie out now. It's actually a report by the TV station. About I'm sorry, it. we can't hear you. I said, there's, there's, a, there's a movie out now put out by a I have reporters on the local TV station in Seattle. It's called Seattle is Dying. And they analyzed the homeless situation. Uh, and they looked at it in, in other states too, also uh, like Rhode Island. The problem with homelessness is not, you know, woe is me. The problem is drugs. And they, they, they looked at all the people who were really homeless and they have a real problem out there and if we're not careful we're going to have the same problem here and it was almost to a person they, they found drugs was the issue and that's what needs to be addressed we've got the same problem in franklin our police are, are fairly gentle with them i would say but uh, they, most of them they offer them a place to stay it's a place to stay now has rules you can't bring contraband and, and they don't want to come you know, how do you cure that it's not a police problem it's really the individual problem and it's drugs it's it. Representative yes, thank you mr chairman I would like to see this bill passed. I don't think it's a police job to do it, but you know, we have so many ordinances in these towns and cities that won't even let little houses into them or any place for these people to go. And they don't all have drugs. They paid low wages, and once they lose a week, work, week of work, 
they're out on the street, so we need to do something to help them. Thank you. Representative O'Hearn. Yes, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. My only question, I guess, would be maybe for the sponsor or, or somebody else, but uh, the realistically, the November reporting back to the uh, everybody, is that going to, uh, after this is passed, going to be a lot of, enough time for that to happen? Representative Knight, you want to respond to that? Um, I mean, I hope that we can put together a team of experienced professionals and police officers, anybody that's willing to be a part of this discussion and come up with something. Um, it's our responsibility to at least try. So I'm going to do my best to meet any deadlines that we have. Does that answer your question? For me, it basically didn't. Um, my question basically is, you know, I've been in the legislature enough to know that things don't happen very quickly. And to have a November reporting that compiles all the information to report back to these uh, bodies uh, doesn't seem realistic to me. Bradley. Thank you, Chair. I want to thank um, Representative Klein Knight for bringing this um, bill forward. I think this is definitely something that's needed um, within our communities, and I will be supporting this bill. Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have several points to bring out. One is the fact that they want to use the whole state for this, not just Manchester. This doesn't. This bill does not refer to homelessness in Manchester, nor does it refer to the homelessness in Nashua or in Franklin or in Derry. And so this is a wide open thing. And like the other representative pointed out, trying to get some, some resolve back by November 1st, I don't think it's possible. And last but not least, a question to my esteemed vice chair, is this a 28A issue? No, not at all. No. So, thank you, Mark. Just to, just to address that, I, and I, if I understand the concern that you know, maybe the issue of homelessness is not a problem on a statewide basis, but but I understand from the testimony that the some of the issues that came up involve state police so i think it's, it's wise to include if it involves state police the argument could be made that it is a statewide issue it's a state concern the manchester and active big bigger highly populated areas as you say although i don't i mean on hail from those districts i still think it's, it's relevant to the state to look at as a whole it's just my thought i don't, I don't think it's, it's wrong to include the whole state you know i think they're going to be looking in the north country and, Full populated areas. I don't I'm just, I would hope the commission uses uses the, the little time that they have to meet with the quick deadline coming up on my Representative Marston. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to make the statement that I should have made my first time. I will be voting no in this bill based on what I stated. But, I know anything you can still be influenced. We'll leave it, we'll leave it for discussion. Uh, Representative Hughes. I'd just like to say that I, I will be supporting this bill. And one of the reasons I like this bill is because the focus of this study uh, isn't looking at the entire universe of homelessness in the state. It really focuses on the relationship between uh, between law enforcement and people who are homeless. Um, I think that over the last uh, few months we've seen with the pandemic that, that that's actually been a real pain point. And I mean, in, in my experience, study committees that tend to be more effective um, have that kind of narrower focus. Uh, I think it's 
what a, what a committee like that will do is it will definitely raise some some larger issues uh, that also need to be addressed. That's part of the part of the deal. But uh, the other part of it is is um, it's not having served on three stu study committees. Um, one of the things uh, you know that I just want to say is that a November deadline is pretty common, and one of the reasons why we have a November deadline is so we can draft legislation uh, in the next session if we think any legislation is needed to implement some of the recommendations that we might have. So a good example of that was the work that we did uh, on the, the bail commissioner's uh, uh, pay issue. So that's an, that's an example of how the process uh, can not only happen quickly, but can result in legislation that we can actually, you know, get passed. So, you know, to me, this just seems to be a good way uh, to give us uh, something to grab onto that will allow us to start to deal with this problem uh, as a body. And it, it's definitely something that we need to do. We have a, we have a housing crisis in this state. Um, we have an economy that could be doing better. That's not necessarily working for a lot of people at the lower end of the scale. And uh, this is just something that uh, strikes me as, as good public policy um, that we can nudge forward with this bill. Thank you. Representative True. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this committee is pretty narrow. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, what the committee would be charged with. Uh, to study the response of law enforcement to homelessness. Um, law enforcement doesn't really have much to do with homelessness or a housing shortage. And uh, it also has the charge of uh, the studies and response of the criminal justice system to homelessness. Uh, criminal justice system doesn't have that much to do with the housing shortage. I heard testimony that uh, people are looking for data uh, about the mental health issues and drug issues and rehabilitation, all of which has nothing to do with what this committee is charged with. This charged with the committee to study how the law enforcement uh, responds to homelessness and how the courts respond to homelessness. Uh, I think on this bill, I'll, uh, I'll be supporting uh, Mr. Master. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative True. So I understand the way the commission, the narrow focus of the commission. My, my understanding is the commission is going to focus on the of law enforcement's response to it. When law, it's when law enforcement is, is dealing with any police related involvement. That's just my understanding of what the commission has study. And then the criminal justice system is the same way. There are, which I'm not really sure how that, I'm not sure how that part's of both uh, explain to it based on the testimony. I understand that they, they could they could easily overlap. But I think at this point, uh, everyone's had a chance to speak so we can we can put the matter to question. Uh, the, the motion is about to pass. Uh, Clerk will call the roll. If you would support, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Vice Chairman Welch. Aye. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Popper. Yes. Representative Green. Which bill is this that we're voting on? Committee to study response to law enforcement development system 286. 286. <laughs> yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Nay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Morrison. No. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gaffrey. Yes. Representative Pantelakis. 
Yes. Representative O'Hearn. Yes. Representative Bordenay. Yes. Representative Muse. Yes. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Bowden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. I have voted 19 yeas and two nays. The motion was about to pass. Pass. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Burt, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would, as long as there's no minority report, I would recommend a consent calendar for this. And that is second by Representative Wallace. No objections. This will be from consent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Gathering, will you be preparing the majority report? Sure. Or would it be Representative Knight? Knight. Opposed. It is her bill. <laughs> Welcome, Representative Gathering. I'll write it. Yep, you got me. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, I will close the public. Uh, we'll, we'll close the executive session on House Bill 286. Yes, I, I, thank you for recognizing me. I didn't understand what Representative Burt said and what that discussion was about. Because there was only two uh, days and 19 days, the, the office task motion, this can be put on the consent count. Rather than have an individual uh, this can be heard individually, it can be put on consent and passed as part of the consent count. Uh, so he's, he's, he's asked this this bill be on the consent count. So we need to post it's on consent. I, I remember when I heard this that consent is out on the consent count it wasn't unanimous. It doesn't have you can have up to two uh, objections to still have it on. Representative Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Whether we whether you change it here within committee or I have to go to the, to the clerk's office and ask to be taken off consent and go on regular calendar, that will happen. So I guess I, what I'm asking is, well, when, when, when Representative Burt moves to put on consent, that was you could still anyone can take it off consent anytime they want. You can support it off the desk. So, but. That's the time when going forward you want to raise that that objection. I want to be represented for his infamous part in the other way around. <laughs> Representative Marston. The reason I didn't object was I didn't hear what he was saying or understand oh. comprehend it. I would have objected if I had heard what he was asking for to be on the consent calendar. It, 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 listen, my understanding is that with, with, we have a lot of stuff, you can still be taken off consent and, and we're not ignoring what you have to say. And clearly, you have an objection. You sound very confident that you're going to remove from consent. So, there's nothing wrong with you doing that. And it's uh, any member of the body is allowed to do it, never mind members of the committee. That would get about a half hour of debating. <laughs> so, this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you don't mind me adding, the only reason to remove it off consent is if you're going to have a floor fight on this particular bill. Um, you know, in the 11 years I've been here, I've only removed one bill off consent. And, um, but that's the purpose to do it. If there's not going to be a floor fight, uh, usually it's better just to leave it on consent and let it go through, and then that way, you know, it just saves a lot of time. But if there's going to be a floor fight, then you need to put in a minority vote. Was that a bill that I was that? No, I oh, no, okay, no, yes, at this time, we will uh close the executive session. On House Bill 286, Representative O'Hearn. Uh, I was 
inquiring. Uh, so it's going to be off the consent calendar because there was an objection? Uh, well, my understanding is Representative Marston is going to take it off the consent calendar or is not agreeing to it being on the consent calendar. So it, we already closed the hearing, but I'm sure we can we can accommodate that request. And I just hope in the interest of time, I, I, I said we can discuss. I would like to reopen the uh, executive session on HB 125 so we can discuss the issue of consent. Thank you very much. Uh, this, at this time, we, we are going to uh, reconvene the executive session on HP 125. At the time that we, we went into recess or suspended the executive session, the date was or the point of order was an amendment has been offered, but it doesn't have a name of a member of the committee on the amendment. In order for a committee member to offer that amendment to the committee still, I did consult with the clerk uh, and I was advised that a member's name does not have to be on the amendment. It's, it's only required that a member can offer the amendment. So the amendment that has Representative Roy's name on it, not a member, can be offered by a representative board. I will say going forward, it is still a great practice to get a member's name on the amendment because you can probably count on that member supporting one vote. Uh, Representative Gordon, I believe you were in the process of offering an amendment. Do you mind reading that amendment number? Uh, yes, I still have, uh, would offer uh, amendment uh, A 2021-0385H, which is the uh, amendment that uh, Representative Roy uh, presented during his testimony for 125. Um, it's very much similar to the amendment he had offered earlier, but without a penalty. Um, I think we should just uh, accept the amendment and pass the bill as amended. Is, and there was there was a second to that. Representative Bradley, are you cleaning your screen or are you seconding the amendment? Not second. Does someone wish to second the amendment? Oh, sorry. Representative Welsh to second the amendment. Point of order. Representative True. Uh, I'm not trying to gum up to work, but I believe the representative when he made the motion referred to 0385. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 3085, which I don't have a copy of, or is that 0385 and even newer? Is the copy not on the paper? No, that's, that's Terry's amendment. I didn't get it. I don't think it's here. Uh, I thought you brought it down. It's emailed. You have it electronically. They emailed it to us. Can you ask Representative Fortney if he had contacted her? Because I know that was a conversation. I'm not sure. Yeah, I can't. You don't have that name. All right, so we're gonna go. We're gonna go into recess again on our. our oh. Mr. Chairman. I was sorry, Representative. But we, not the members in the room. There are three members physically present who don't have a computer, uh, so they don't have a way to read the amendment. So I'm gonna. I said we use our time to launch another executive session, and the Madam Clerk is in contact with the to print out that amendment and bring it down to us. So we're going to go into recess again on, we're going to suspend the executive session on HB 125. Mr. Chair. 
up. Just two hands up. Keep two hands up. I recommend that we move on to House Bill. The, the clerk, uh, the, the committee assistant is going to be requested that that amendment be brought down. If there's no point in us going forth. It's in fairness to the members, who can't read it. I only speak to the voice and can't read it. But I, I would say we, we have a public hearing at two. I, I, I can answer questions, but we're not going to get to these executive sessions. And I hear you guys don't like staying late. Point of order. Point of order. I recognize. In order to vote for or against an amendment, it's under my understanding that in committee you must have a written amendment in but front of you. I would agree with you 100%. And that's why we're not going forward with the amendment. Right now, in the committee assistant has been asked to bring it down. Thank you. I would, I would hope that people don't just vote on amendments and don't read them. So I wouldn't expect anyone to do that. So I just say we move on to another one. It's let it be brought down. So that's only in BC, Mr. Chairman. So this time, we're going to open, reopen, reopen the executive session on House Bill 338. 338. Yes. Well, we, we had a lengthy discussion on this bill the last time we were here. Uh, and I will recognize Representative Gaffright for a motion of. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? Oh, I got it. Mr. Secretary, if I represent Wells. Mr. Gafford, you wish to speak on your, your motion to block the gas? Yes, um, in the hearing, um, I'm just one of those that struggle with always increasing penalties um, when we have no data on the previous increase in penalty, let's put it that way. So um, I like to offer that whoever steals a dog shall be guilty of a misdemeanor for the first offense, a class B felony for the second offense, and a class A felony for each subsequent offense. And that's it. I think that's much better than the event that I have, so I will support this. I agree with you. Sit. I just say I had an amendment, essentially doing what, sort of what she suggested, but her graduated uh, way of first, second, third. It's much better. Point one. Give a point of order. Give a question. So I would, you know, we want to keep the point of order as, in, as an objection and just interrupt the hearing. So question? Yeah. Did you recognize for a question? Is this amendment 0342H being discussed now or? Yeah. I'm sorry, I should have said what mine was. Mine is 2021 0395H. Oh, that is in the room. I, I yeah. can't help you that. It was over there. I now have it. Give me one. All right. Mr. Harvey, you have mine. Good. So, it's to take an hour to find you. Thank you, sir. Another hour to read it. Yes, yeah. sir. I don't need it. <laughs> Thank you. That's not very nice. That's accurate. It's not nice. <laughs> Uh, I will say that there was competing amendments. There was one amendment that had a dollar amount in there. Thank you. Although I respect the uh, concept of the amendment, the uh, idea was to not have the dollar amount be an issue. Of course, I think Representative Jaffer's uh, amendment that I no longer have a copy of. The seeds of that goal. Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Representative, for putting in an amendment. That is where I have a little bit of problem. I want to try and wrap everything into this problem. Bert wants to make sure that somebody who's 17. Correct. 
And she wants to say, the first time somebody steals a dog, it's a misdemeanor. And the person that does steal a dog, whether they're a minor or an adult, steals a eight or nine thousand dollar dog, is it a misdemeanor? Mm -hmm. I leave that as a question to the committee. Representative Burke, may I answer that, Mr. Chairman? You may, you may respond. Uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, final representative, for the question or statement. Um, if I'm reading this right, I can support this, but I'm assuming if little Bobby, Tommy, whatever his name is, steals an $8,000 dog, this goes out the window. I'm guessing because of the value, which currently, if you can prove that dog is worth that much money, and I hope somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, um, you've already gone up to a class B felony, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hopefully you can correct me if I'm wrong. So the misdemeanor would be wiped out. I didn't I did mm -hmm. give my copy the amount of the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Hopper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like the honor of seconding the uh, uh, Amendment 0395H. I don't think anybody seconded it again. Uh, it was seconded by Representative Welch. Oh, it was. I'm sorry. I didn't hear it. Now. And I will say, uh, Representative Marston, I Oh, I agree that this should be a felony. I, I advocated very hard for that last, uh, last time we were here. And I didn't get it. And I was, this is a concession on my end, this amendment, but at the same time, if the amendment fails, I would support the, the bill as written as well. So I think at this time we can put, we can put the, uh, the clerk to call a roll. I see no further hands. The, um, the question before is now whether to adopt the amendment 0395 It is. Call roll. Representative, I'm sorry, Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burt. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yes. Representative Green. No. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yes. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. No. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathright. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Yes. Representative O'Hearn. Yes. Representative Bordenay. Yes. Representative Mews. Yes. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 19 yeas. By a vote of 19 yeas and two days, the uh, amendment uh, passes. Now the motion on the motion is uh, on the pass with the amendment. I believe we discussed this in detail already, so I think we can go right to the vote. To uh, try to follow all the vote. The question is Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My only question, and I don't know if this is a point of order, but I have before me, I thought, a, an amendment to this bill as well from Representative Testament. And are we hearing that or not? So the one that is so there only can be one amendment offered. All right. The, the committee is not, not committed 
be considered two amendments. They, if anything, the amendments would have to be combined. I will say the, the amendments, the way they're written, could not coexist in any way you want. So there's no need to combine them. Uh, it is the chair, at the chair's discretion to recognize Representative Gaffrey, policy amendment. I understand. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I heard uh, in testimony that uh, current law states, well, current law since 1977, states that stealing a dog is a misdemeanor. Now we have an amendment that says stealing a dog is a misdemeanor. I, I just think this gets messier and messier. Um, certainly worthy of, uh, of retaining. I, I do, I'm not quite sure. I know what we're passing now. Um, it just seems very messy, Mr. Mr. Chair, very messy. President, sure, your, your point is well taken. I think the difference between what we're passing now and what is the existing law would be the subsequent test, to my understanding. Okay, we're talking about misdemeanor, class A misdemeanor, so class B felony, so class A felony. If I had it my way, it would have been a class B felony, but. Judging from the environment of this room, I didn't think that was happening, so I share your disappointment. So we either can ITL it, pass it, and it. I, I still think it's I mean, a dog. I, when I, my wife and I bought a dog, it was $3,000. If you stole $2,000 from me, that's a class A felony. So I don't understand how stealing the dog, but that point did not get me in. So right now, I. I Rather than repeat myself from last year, I think the clerk can dramatically put the question. But the clerk will call the roll. The motion is about to pass an amendment. If you in support of the motion about to pass the amendment, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. So, one question. Do we have to move it again? Did the sheet, oh. the the sheet you still have to make? No, we have to pass it. Right, but we still need names. The motion was made. I made it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was made. You, made, you actually made this is your motion. No, I just has as amended. But after we made the, the second one, mm -hmm. I'm trying to go. The sheets come to the beginning. Two bags, okay. Didn't you make the motion? <laughs> Try to get to do the motion again? Yeah. Okay. Everybody together, did you recognize to make a motion of office pass with amendment? Yes. I move office pass as amended. I second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Senior 395H. That's correct. Thank you for pointing that out. Can you guys look back a little? <laughs> I thought I heard it. I thought I, I I'm gonna play it that way, but anyway, <laughs> you can call the roll. Vice Chairman Welch. Hi. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yep. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. No. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. No. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gatray. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Yes. Representative O'Hearn. Yes. Representative Bordenay. Yes. Representative Muse. Yes. Representative Newman. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yay or nay? Representative Newman votes yes. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman. 
I put 19 yeas and two nays. Motion of uh, the pass is amended. Would someone like to move for consent? I'll make a move for consent. Dr. Lutz moves consent for a third true. Second. Second. Mr. Marston, you may be able to get one more exact session. Uh, Representative Marston. Thank you. Um, I will write a no word for my daughter where one is built, and I will also move to take it off the consent so that I can speak to that to the board. I'll be a popular guy. Do that. <laughs> I'll be a popular guy. Uh, you know, I, I do respect the position of the Mark's secretary. They have a lot of children. Disappointed we couldn't pass that for you. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I understand that it cannot be not consent. He's writing my knowledge. He's, he's objecting. It's not going on consent. He objected to my own consent. Oh, okay. Before I close it, last time I closed it, I already closed it. So oh, I see. Once I close it. Yes, I'd just like to say thank you to John for voting with me three times. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Panalakis, it's what you had on the side of your cushion that scares me. <laughs> okay. Recognize her point of order. I hope yeah. that's we have representatives speaking out of turn here, having their own conversation. Don't trust trouble. I don't think that's a point of order. I, you know, let's just move on to the. We can actually, if, rather than debate points of order, that whether it is a point of us, we have nine minutes, so we don't have to stay past five. I think we can sneak in another executive session for two o'clock. So let's. I believe the amendment is now here for HP 125. Is that correct? That is yes. Correct. The executive passed out. All right. Let's open the executive session. Or let's reopen the executive session on HB 125. And at this point in time, Representative Boardman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer Amendment A 2021-0385H. Uh, this is basically the amendment that uh, Representative Roy presented in his testimony this for the bill itself. Set this tweet process up. This amendment. I'll second it. Second by Representative Gaffrey. Just to be clear, there was a, a motion previously made about the pass and off the amendment. Uh, this, that was. A couple hours ago, so just to clarify that, Representative Boyd, just to clean it up for the people listening, if you want to just restate your motion, I'd like to cast it off the amendment and we we'll have that second. Uh, did he hear you? Representative Bordenay, just to clarify for the members of the public listening at home, because you did make a motion of what to pass the off an amendment. However, that was about two hours ago. So I think just for the purpose of uh, public interest to make sure it was going on for you mind just restating your motion? The motion is to uh, auto pass with amendment A 2021-0385H. Uh, Thank you. And, and just to clarify that that has been seconded by Representative Jaffray, correct? Yes. Yes. I now open it up, open the the amendment up for discussion. Representative True. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um laws or RSAs do not prevent crime. Laws or RSAs punish crime. There is no punishment. If you violate this this uh, this bill, this bill becomes law. There's no punishment. I don't see any value in passing anything if there's no way to enforce it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Yes. Representative O'Hearn. Well, I was going to say this last time, but uh, you were more concerned about everybody in the room, but I have not received a revised copy of that uh, amendment. So until I do, I will vote no. Uh, for example, thank you for bringing that to my uh, to our attention. Uh, the Madam Clerk is kind of is forwarding you a copy by email as we speak. Representative Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd just like to point out that. You know that one of the things that we try to do through legislation as well, uh, especially in this committee, is to protect public safety. Um, we also uh, look at privacy issues. Um, I think one of the things that we struggle with all the time is how much to penalize people or to not penalize people. Um, I think Representative Roy really sort of hit the hit the nail on the head when he said that this bill, you know, basically hits a, a, a sweet spot. What it, what it does is it prevents behavior uh, that's potentially harmful to an individual long-term who's never been convicted of a crime. Um, but what it, what, it also, what it also seems to do is it also seems to split the difference with the public's right to know. So um, there's nothing in this bill that prevents a person's name uh, from, from being printed or that wouldn't make their name subject to a, a right to know request. So what it, what it really does seem to do uh, is to really kind of hit the nail on the head when it comes to that situation that Representative Klein Knight described, which is, you know, somebody literally on the worst night of their life who might not even be convicted of the crime, having their picture permanently in social media, uh, maybe for the rest of their life, and being subject to, uh, to ridicule. Um, to me, uh, that seems to be a situation that's, you know, worth taking care of and that's within the purview of this committee to take care of. Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I simply want to acknowledge what my colleague across the way from me, Representative True, mentioned that there's no penalty involved in this. And with that being said, I will make a, I will vote no on this bill with amendments. Representative Gordon. Excuse me, Representative Boyd. I do need to recognize Representative Popper first. He has to be spoken. Representative Popper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a little bit about strategy. Um, is a bill like this is a lot easier to get through without a penalty. It's a lot but more likely to make it through the Senate and be signed by the governor. And in the next legislative session, if we find that police are not abiding by it, that would be the time to add a penalty. If we add a penalty to begin with, then we'll have the forces arrayed against us and it'll never make it through the Senate. So strategically, the amendment is a lot better than adding a penalty. Thanks. And I'm just going to say I understand that there's some issues with not having a penalty, Representative Marston. Uh, we've gone down that road and we can work out some that. So this is where we are now. I agree that it, it, I think this bill would this will be better sorted if it had a penalty written in there, but that amendment failed. So uh, I still think that the, the policy is, is really good policy, and I'm, I'm going to support the of the past. Representative Borne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was actually basically going to say the same thing that Representative uh, Hopper said, but he said it better than I did. So uh, that's really all I have to offer. Yeah. Well, uh, hands raised. Uh, the clerk to call the roll. Uh, it's, it's the question, the nominee put the question is whether to adopt 
10 minutes. 0385H. In favor of adopting the amendment, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Or can I call the roll? Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yes, ma'am. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Nay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. No. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathright. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Yes. Representative O'Hearn. And because I haven't received it yet, no. Representative Borden A. Yes. Representative Mews. Yes. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Hopper. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Chairman Abbas. Your votes, yes. A vote of 18 yeas and three nays, the amendment has been adopted. Let's make sure we get this right. Representative Bordney, would you like to be recognized to make a motion on the pass as amended? Can we, can we see if we can get that? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would like to offer that a motion. I um, move that we okay. pass as amended House of Bill uh, HB 125. Representative Hopper, second. We recognize the second. Representative Gaffrey, you wish to speak to your motion? Or excuse me, sorry, Representative Borden, you wish to speak to the motion? About the pass is amended. Seeing no discussion and no comments. Can, can I just verify what you have this legislative email? Certainly. Future.ohern at leg.state.nh.us. Ohern is one word, right? No, no. Future.ohern, that's correct. Right. Um, it's not to make sure. Well, let's be a discussion. It's a motion of a pocket pass as amended. What bill? We're on House Bill 338. We just, we're, we're on House Bill 125. We just passed that 18 to 3. Now we got to vote on the bill. Now we got to vote on the motion. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Well, I think the matter can put the question right now. Seeing no hands raised to discuss the motion. Open up all the roll. The motion is applied to pass as amended. If you're in favor, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Vice Chairman Loach. Yes. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yep. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testament. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. No. Clerk votes yes. 
Representative Gaffrey. Yes. Representative Cantalakis. Yes. Representative O'Hearn. No. Representative Bourdain. Yes. Representative Muse. Yes. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Chairman Abbas. The chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman, vote is 19. By a vote of 19 yeas and two nays, the motion of five to pass as amended is passed. Mr. Chairman, if there's not going to be a four fight, I would recommend consent. But if there's going to be a four fight, then. Is there any objection? Representative Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Are you objected to consent? I, I, I don't understand that what Mr. Representative Burt said about a floor fight. I don't think you have to have a floor fight for every bill, but I think by if something passes with some no votes, so I think somebody ought to be able to speak about why they voted no and let the House itself not get into a big fight, but just understand the arguments and maybe they will too decide to vote no on the whole thing in the house. What? Well, let me just clarify. When, when Representative Burt says floor fight, I don't think he means that in a, in a negative undertone. It's, it's often a term we use as a, as a debate. We call it. So it's not meant for ordering by any means. I didn't perceive that. So if there is two objections, the two name votes and the rest are yes to pass, what can happen is if you put on consent, and that usually when it matters on consent, it means that there won't be a floor debate on the bill or on the, on the record, the motion. So with that being said, if someone were to remove it from the consent count, being removed, the tradition is the person removing it normally would be the member participating in the floor debate. So I, I, I believe what Representative Burr is saying, if you, if you don't intend on participating in the floor debate, he's, I think, suggesting or trying to encourage you not to object to this going on. That's my understanding. Uh, it is, but what we can do is, it's 208, we do have a public hearing at 2 o'clock, the members of the public waiting. If you have a question, we can, I, I say, I can stay after five minutes, but I, I just want to keep everything, everything going. Is this a question about the consent calendar? All right, last question. You're objecting it to the going on consent? Yes, I am objecting to the consent calendar. Okay. Representative Newman, you have a you, you hand up? Yes, I did, and but I think it was just answered by that. Thank you very much. Object if you wish. <clears throat> Thank you. At this time, we'll close the, uh, the executive session on House Bill 125. At this time, we're opening the, the public hearings uh, on House Bill 93 that will be heard simultaneously with House Bill 180. The purposes of, of, of the members of the public testimony will be limited to one minute. Uh, for each for the members of the public, with the exception to the representatives that are introducing the bill. And it's with uh, great pleasure that our, our, our representative, it's an honor to hear from you. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak to uh, HB 93FN. But before you begin, I just want to say that it, when I say it's, it's great to hear from you, we're all praying for you. It's, it's good to hear you. It's nice to be here. I almost wasn't. So uh, through a COVID battle, it was uh, almost took my life, but I'm coming <laughs> back strong and uh, off oxygen for a week. So. 
May, may I proceed, sir? Yes, you may. Sorry to do um, Imagine a kid walking into uh, a movie theater to watch an R movie or uh, going into a strip club. And of course, they can't. But they can take any smartphone and do it. Uh, uh, any smartphone and uh, get into that material. There may be a safe search that can turn off, but they can get at it. And so th this bill uh, puts a filter in uh, to, to prevent that from happening, does not prevent any adult from accessing any material they want. They can sign up to remove the filter for a nominal fee. Um, and the, the money going from that fee to the state it is to, is to uh, support anti-child trafficking initiatives. And there's a list in the bill of what that would do. And uh, this, this uh, bill as written passes constitutional muster because Supreme Court and other courts have found out that filtering is a least harmful way of, uh, of, uh, of, of blocking material, objectionable material. So it does pass constitutional muster. It does protect our children. Uh, both from seeing un, uh, uh, materials they should not see and protect them from being exploited. That's it, in a nutshell. <clears throat> you know, he is raised, uh, Representative, uh, you are excused. Thank you, thank you, testing. Thank you. Yes. You recognize that introduce HB one eighty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Representative Linda Massimilla, and I represent the towns of Littleton and Bethlehem. As some of the past committee representatives might recognize that HB 180 was presented in 2019 as HB 201, and it was referred to interim study that summer, came out of study with ought to pass recommendation, and then came out of the committee with that recommendation. In a roll call vote in 2020, the House voted 314 to 55 to pass HB 201 which moved on to the Senate and then COVID happened and the rest is history. The bill before you, HB 180 is the same bill as it was as HB 201. It would increase the penalty for purchases of sex with a minor from a class B to a class A felony. It eliminates distinctions between traffickers and buyers by recognizing the equal role buyers play in creating a supply and demand marketplace for the buying and selling of trafficked children for sex. Current law classifies the act of persons purchasing sex with a minor as a class B felony, which carries a three and a half to seven year prison term and a fine of no greater than $4,000. HB 180 would raise the penalty to seven and a half to 15 years with the same monetary penalty. So what crimes are classified as class B and class A felonies in New Hampshire? Class B felonies in New Hampshire include computer fraud, possession of small amounts of illegal substances, driving while intoxicated fourth offense and above, theft of property valued at more than 500, but less than $1,000, shoplifting, simple assault, and the buying of sex with a minor. Class A felonies include murder, manslaughter, kidnapping, theft of property over $1,000, sec second or subsequent conviction for aggravated felonious sexual assault and drug crimes. Judges have sentencing discretion, even in felony cases, unless the minimum sentence is mandatory. 
and their, their discretion is to whether to sentence to prison time, probation, or unconditional or conditional discharge by factoring such things as the defendant's criminal record, the extent of injury or damage caused, the impact of the crime on the victim or the community, and the extent to which the defendant has addressed life circumstances such as addiction. As of 2017, according to the National Criminal Justice Reference Service, 41 states have statutes that make penalties for the buyers of commercial sex acts with minors as high or almost as high as the federal penalties, which are, if a child is under the age of 14 or if force, fraud, or coercion was used, a penalty of not less than 15 years in prison up to life is imposed. And if the victim is 14 to 17 years, the minimum is not less than 10, but also up to life. So who are these buyers of sex with minors? A Boston psychology study by Melissa Farley et al found that the income level spanned from the lowest of 20,000 with the highest of over $140,000. The, um, the education of these buyers, 40% of them were college or graduate, with, had a college or graduate degree. The race was mostly white and the gender was male and the age was 20 to 75 years of age and 40% of them were married. The economic principles of supply and demand is driven by the demand. The sex trade is founded on that principle. According to the Brooklyn Law School in their Journal of Law and Policy, the fastest way to dismantle a market is to dissolve the demand. And a study from the De Department of Justice put this aptly, quote, without the demand for commercial sex, there would be no market forces, pr forces producing and sustaining the roles of pimps and traffickers as distributors, nor would there be a force driving the production of a supply of people to be sexually exploited. Supply and distribution are symptoms. Demand is the cause. I am sensitive to and in, I, in support of critical and meaningful criminal justice reform efforts, and I'm in full support of that. However, I am simultaneously listening to survivors, service providers, and advocates who continuously deal detail the severe harm that buyers cause. We are talking about people who are paying to rape children and who our criminal justice systems have historically ignored, not over or unjustly criminalized. Buyers have historically been insulated by meaningful criminal, account by meaningful criminal accountability because of their social status. If we are willing to hold the traffickers, largely people who are not white middle-class men, accountable with class A penalties, then we must be willing to hold those who are actually committing the sexually violent acts against children to the same standard. Regarding deterrence, it's all but impossible to measure deterrence simple because we are talking about an act that never occurred or never came to full fruition. However, penalties are not simply put in place to deter crime. They are put in place to hold offenders accountable, to bring justice to survivors and to increase community safety. When House Bill 201 came up for um, a vote, 
Governor Sununu sent to the chairman, uh, chairman Cushing at the time, a letter that said, it is imperative that we take this immediate action to further protect victims of sex trafficking. I am writing you today to express my support of what was then House Bill 201 relative to enhancing penalties for sex buyers exploiting trafficked children. It is my hope that the committee will strongly endorse the measure. At one time, New Hampshire was a leader against human trafficking as we were one of the first states to criminalize this activity. As a result, service providers across the state have been able to assist survivors of sex and labor trafficking to help rebuild their lives. We must continue that tradition, signed Governor Christopher Sununu. Thank you for listening. Representative, thank you very much for your, your testimony. Thank you. Seeing no hands raised, oh, excuse me, Representative Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, do you realize that we changed this, uh, the penalty for this in 2017 uh, to a class uh, B felony? Uh, has that made it a difference? Again, as I, I stated in my opening uh, testimony, that deterrence is really something that hasn't or seems not to be able to be measured simply because it is a crime. It's a crime that is not, that never occurs or it never came to full fruition, so it's hard to measure. Representative President? Thank you for taking Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for taking my question. Um, you listed some states with some really stiff penalties. How come we're not asking for those kind of stiff penalties in this bill? Um, I'm sorry, Representative, you are breaking up, so I couldn't hear the question. During your testimony, you talked about some states that had some very stiff penalties compared to these penalties. Say that again. Could somebody sort of translate what he's saying because he's really breaking up and I'm only getting part of the question. During your, during your testimony, you, you talked about some states that have a very strong penalty. Yes. Why, did, why aren't you trying for those kind of penalties? Because those type of penalties are exactly what went along with the federals, federal guidelines. And I know that looking at criminal justice reform, we're trying to um, take in consideration the perpetrator's um, background and motives as well as the victims. Okay. Representative Bordney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, so in line seven and eight, neither the actor's lack of knowledge or other person's age, nor consent of the other person still constitute an offense and a charge under this paragraph. Now we're looking at a felony charge. So there, you, usually in a major crime like this, we need intent. And you are basically saying that intent is taken out of the uh, equation. Is, is that what you really want to happen? Again, can you repeat your question? Maybe it's on my end of the computer but I'm having a hard time hearing you. Fine. Lines uh, seven and eight, neither the actor's lack of knowledge of the other person's age nor uh, consent of the person shall constitute a defense to a charge under this paragraph. 
Now we are talking about a penalty of a class A uh, felony. Uh, you're taking out uh, intent as 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 uh, part of the uh, uh, justification of the of the penalty. Is that really what you want to do? When you say taking out the intent, what do you mean? Usually, when you have or looking at a major crime that you're going to be uh, found guilty of, you have to actually do it, and you have to actually intend to do it. And uh, right now, you've taken intent away. Well, if, if you're referring to the one about the actor's lack of knowledge, that is already in um, law in New Hampshire, as far as they cannot use that as a defense. Yes, but that is as a, a class B felony, which I think is, is a little different than a class A felony because you're looking at major prison time. You're, you're looking at major prison time as far as it would be eight more years than the top penalty for class B. Um, when you're talking about children and you're clumping them in a class B felony that has to do with computer fraud and shoplifting, I really think that our value of children should not be clumped with computer fraud and driving intoxicated for the fourth offense. So when I first introduced the bill for a class B felony, I was told, as you know, that when you introduce things, you should go in small increments. So instead of going to a class A felony immediately, I decide I was, it was suggested that I start with a class B and that's what I did. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Galbraith. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my question, Representative. Um, my question is, has there been any data captured since um, the bill changed from a misdemeanor to a class B? Data as far as Follow up clarification. Any data around um, since it was um, changed to a class B felony? Do you have any data as to what effect it's had on, um, I guess, uh, people doing the same thing over and over again? Um, I have looked for data like that, um, Representative, but unfortunately, the data does not seem to be there as far as the effects of this, because obviously you would have to do some sort of survey of people who might be intending to have sex with a minor, but I don't think you would have a very willing um, sample come forward to participate in that type of a survey. And um, so I don't, I, I haven't seen any data regarding that. Oh, um, the data that I was referring to is people that have been arrested. Has there been any uh, increase in um, the arrests or decreases in the arrests? That's what I'm looking for when I was speaking of the data. Okay, I, I checked with the Department of Corrections and at the state prison in New Hampshire, they do not keep track of data like that. Thank you. Thank you. Being no hands raised, I want to thank the representative for her testimony. Thank you. Or excuse me. I just want to remind members of the public that the testimony will be limited to one minute at a time. We'll be calling Stephen uh, Kneeb, K-A-N-E-B. There's a Stephen K, Mr. Chairman. Would that be him? Or Steve K. Okay, let's give it a try. All right. Uh, 
asked him to unmute. And just, just a reminder, your testimony is limited to one minute. He's not on mute, Mr. Chairman. So maybe he doesn't want to speak. Well, the next witness, Darlene. Uh, Pollock? Pollock, yes. Pollock? Any, any glasses? Yep, she's in. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, you can. I thank you so much for hearing my testimony today. For the record, my name is Darlene Pollock. I am a juvenile sex trafficking survivor from here in New Hampshire. I was 13 years old when I was groomed for trafficking. I was sold at 14, I was 90 pounds, barely developed, and the men who bought me wanted my youth. When I was 16 and 17 years old, being trafficked with other girls my age, we were already too old for some buyers. I went through a lot of physical, uh, mental um, disease, all kinds of terrible things during my time being trafficked. It was violent very often. When people think of buying sex, they think of buying sex like you would have with someone you care for. This is not what happens when people buy sex very often. I have a lot of compassion for young people. I understand they're growing up in a hyper-sexualized, hyper-violent world right now, but I ask you to pass House Bill 180 and send a message to buyers that New Hampshire is not going to allow them to buy children without consequence. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Representative Pressman. Thank you for letting me ask this question. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, do you think that we should pass a bill that would somehow carve out an exemption for a situation where a person was under 20 having sex with somebody 15 or 16. I do, sir. And the reason for that is because their, their brains just aren't developed and they can't really tell how old a person is sometimes. I think that that would be... Um, a beneficial carve out. Thank you. I expect you would still leave it as a class B felony for that age group. Thank you. Seeing, seeing no hands raised, I, I wanna thank the witness for her testimony. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you members in, of the committee. Steve K has his, has his hand raised. So let's, let's, all right. Hello, can you hear me okay? Listen, just a reminder, your testimony is limited to one minute and please uh, clarify whether you are testifying in support of a House Bill 93, House Bill 180 or both. I'm testifying in favor of 180. Uh, Human trafficking is a modern form of slavery. Its perpetrators methodically identify vulnerable people, especially young women, and then groom them for monetary gain through enslavement. As a society, we owe it to these victims to give law enforcement the necessary tools to reduce demand for the sex services on which such slavery thrives. House Bill 180 provides one such tool for our law enforcement professionals I urge you to vote ought to pass. And I can uh, submit a written uh, statement. I want to thank you for your testimony. And seeing no hands raised, so witness, the witness is excused. Oh, Jessica Neely? Mr. Chairman, I do not see that name, Jessica. Uh, let me look under Neely just in case. Again, I do not see that name.
Yes. Well, thank you for the opportunity to hear what I have to say. I'm asking you to support the bipartisan bill HB 93. My name is Cam Olette. I'm from New London and I work with Special Forces of Liberty de facto attorney generals. I'm asking you to protect young minds and next generation from lurking dangers. These children are our future, the future of our families, the future of our nation. Pornography is a drug. It triggers an addictive response in the brain. Just like we protect our young people from the dangers of drug and alcohol, we must also protect their minds from pornography. Modern technology has created new problems that we must urgently solve. Our children are carrying around access to the internet and mobile devices with no restrictions. We must protect the innocent of the youth with all the fervor that we have by demanding all products with access to the internet be sold with the safety of our children put first by protecting them from the dangers of pornographic material. Please vote in favor of HB 93, the Human Trafficking and Child Exploitation Prevention Act. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing, seeing no hands raised, the witnesses are Chair recognizes Greg uh, Quinlan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not see any Greg on the list. Senator for Garden State Families. Oh, there. They're lobbyists. If there's any uh, members of the public who wish to testify on House Bill 93 or House Bill 180, please raise your hands. Hello, Mr. Chairman, members of the committees. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Greg Quinlan, Jessica, some other members have been trying to get on, but they just had some technical, technical difficulty, but I think I can speak on their behalf. But former Judge Advocate General, former Assistant United States Attorney, this bill was written out of a multitude of multi-state federal litigation. Over 20 states are moving on this bill. There's a trigger provision included in House Bill 93 by Representative Plett that requires at least four other states pass the bill before it becomes law. This is a bill that says going forward in the state, any retailer or manufacturer of an internet-enabled device is required to install a filter that automatically blocks by default websites that are known to facilitate human trafficking and prostitution and websites that display X-rated material that would be injurious to children. If the consumer is an adult and they want to have access to adult websites, they can. They got to show proof of ID to the retailer and pay a one-time fee of not nominal fee of $20 which is remitted back to the state to go to a grant fund administered by the, the attorney general's office to finance any group that's working to uphold community standards of decency or combat sex related offenses. I got four quick talking points. Number one, Ashcroft versus the ACLU. The Supreme Court of the United States found that Congress, the legislative branch, may undoubtedly act to encourage the use of filters that encourage parents to use filters and the tech companies to develop better filter technology. That was the Supreme Court informing the legislative branch to pass this bill. Number two, Ginsburg versus New York. Supreme Court decision where they upheld the constitutionality of the display statute. New Hampshire has that statute in place. That's the statute that requires the gas stations and the newsstands to put x-rated material behind a blind or rack that can only be removed if the consumer is adult they show proof of id and pay for it number three the, the we always normally start a hearing when we have a lot of time by saying why is it that a 12 year old uh, we have to limit testimony to one minute uh, your time has expired you went over by about 20 seconds uh, however uh, representative Burke, you do have a question for the witness yes i do thank you mr chairman and thank you for taking my question uh, how many states currently did you say have this uh, a similar bill and does it work in those states because I know kids are, you know, if I need um, anything done on my cell phone I bring it to my grandkids and they fix it. Uh, so, yes, sir. So first of all, there are four states have passed the last section of the bill. We call it the Admission Act when it's run separately. Texas was the first state. That's the part that says you got to pay $5 to enter a strip club. That goes to the same grant fund that the one-time $20 filter deactivation fee goes to. That has been incredibly successful. It's been challenged. It went to the Texas Supreme Court, and the Texas Supreme Court upheld that in a case called Combs versus Texas Entertainment for two reasons. Number one, the fee is nominal, and number two, the fee doesn't go to the general fund. It goes to all of these kind of groups like the child advocacy centers and the human trafficking task force and things of that nature now utah has passed a filter statute in 2006 and it says this it says going forward in that state 
uh, if a person has an ISP, Comcast, AT&T, they can demand that, I, that the ISP install a filter, but they can charge a filter installation fee. So members of our team sued the state of Utah in 2016 to say, you guys got that backwards. It should be that the filter comes on the front end. And instead of subjecting consumers like schools, parents, and teachers, and children to a filter installation fee, there should be a filter deactivation fee. Now, the, comp the company should keep a piece of that, but the state needs a part of that so we can finance all of these great groups in New Hampshire that we've been talking with that, you know, c are fighting to uphold con community standards of decency. So, but no state has passed the filter bill, but I mean, every state touching you basically is running the, the measure. I mean, I can name the sponsors, be glad to do that. But uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Seeing no uh, further hands raised, the witness is excused. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have a John Jr. And uh, just please state your full name for the record, where you are from and whether you uh, which bill you are testifying on behalf of and whether you are in support or in opposition to that bill. Your testimony is limited to one minute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Members of the committee, yeah, my name is John Gunter Jr. and I work with a group called the Clean Services Foundation and the Special Forces of Liberty. We've been fighting pornography for about 15 years and human trafficking for about six, as we know that human trafficking and pornography are highly linked. And we have children in every state that we run by. We, we work with groups, we work with legislators. We're trying to do the best thing we can to protect our children for the future. I've got three children, three girls and a boy, and they have run into pornography on quote unquote accident. And we know that they're being targeted and we know they are being um, coerced into seeing material that is not constitutional for them to see as a child or is not safe for their minds. And we know that sex is great in the right context, but when it comes to a child in certain forms, in certain areas of pornography, it is demeaning, it is demoralizing, and it gives them the wrong perception of what the human body is for and what the, the nature of sex is for. So I would vote in favor of House Bill 93. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. This time, Thank you. the chair is recognizing Bob Dunn. Uh, again, just please state whether you're testifying in support or opposition to uh, House Bill 93 or House Bill 180. And please state where you're from. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Bob Dunn, the Director of Public Policy for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Manchester. And I'm here today to register our support for HB 180. Um, human trafficking is something that is of major concern to the Catholic Church here in New Hampshire and across the world. Uh, Pope Francis, in fact, has called human trafficking nothing less than a crime against humanity. HB 180 focuses on the most egregious forms of this most egregious crime. Right now, by definition, we have a class B type of penalty for what is clearly a class A sort of crime in terms of its gravity. So passing 180 would send the right message to would-be buyers and traffickers, and importantly, to their victims as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn, for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. We have, it just says Christine's Galaxy, but Christine, uh, please state your full name for the record, where you're testifying from, and whether you're testifying in support or opposition to House Bill 93 and or House Bill 180. And your testimony is limited to one minute. My name is Christine Wheely, and I am the founder of One Heart Ministries, um, Minnesota, and I am testifying in regards to House Bill 93. I fully support this bill, and I have uh, one of my ministry partners has sent over a written uh, testimony to you in regards to that. I just want to say uh, quickly that I minister and I pastor families um, who have had devastations due to the addictions that pornography has uh, has, and so this filter 
upfront on the fore end of it will help protect the families, marriages, and the children who um, have access to uh, these devices. Um, and so I just wanted to just say vote in favor of House Bill 93. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised. See. Mauer? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And just a reminder, your testimony is limited to women. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Tiffany Marler. I'm the co-founder and vice chair of No More Tears 21-4 and the director of Missouri for Special Forces of Liberty. I'm also a survivor consultant and a survivor of human trafficking. I am in support of HB 93 here today, and I ask that you please do support this because this is going to drastically, drastically change the way that we implement and help our children today. I was a victim of everything that is in your bill. I have submitted a nice long written testimony, so I'm going to keep this very short. Um, you can read it and I attached a picture along it to it with my survivor story because I am an author and there's no way for me to get this any shorter than I absolutely already have for you guys today. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, the witness is excused. Representative Gabbard, do you have a question? Yeah. Chair? Um, was there someone who was supposed to come testify, I guess? He told him to to get the person's name All right. All right. Well, if there are any members of the public who have not testified already that are in attendance, uh, please raise your hand. Jessica, I do not see a Jessica. Uh, let me double check. No. Then what's the last name, Mr. Chairman? And Neely. Neely. N E E L Y. I apologize, I do not see that name. All right, at this time, uh, we will close the public hearing on House Bill 93. And we'll close the public hearing. On House Bill 180. Sponsor, should we have names? Oh, yeah. Linda Harrison. We are recognizing the representative. There is a name of a member of the public. I believe you wanted to remind myself. I'm going to gap right about. Please refresh our members. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that. When Darlene Pollock testified, a representative made a suggestion that maybe a carve out or an amendment be made to keep a class B felony for um, buyers under the age of 20, I believe. And I just wanted to let you know that I would support that as long as the class A stayed for buyers above that age. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Hey, see, see, Representative Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, does Repres Representative Muse have the uh, numbers for these two bills for food laws? Representative, Representative Muse, do you wish to read the uh, the numbers of support and opposition for House Bill? <clears throat> yes, I do. For House Bill 180, uh, 196 people signed in in support, and uh, only two people signed in uh, in opposition. And for House Bill 93, uh, nine people signed in in support and 11 people signed in in opposition. 
Any terms of abuse? At this time, we will close the public hearing on HB 93 and the public hearing on HB 180. Uh, we will stand in recess uh, to, to 3 p.m. We'll be we'll be conducting some executive sessions. So I, I ask all the members to stay.
Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at this time, the chair is opening the executive session on CACR8. The chair is recognizing Representative Wallace for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will pass on CACR8. Is there a second? I'll second it. The motion of about to pass is seconded by Representative Green. Representative Wallace, do you wish to speak on your motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll speak to that briefly. Uh, CACR8 will send a message to the federal government that uh, we're here in New Hampshire. Uh, support and respect and are going to reaffirm and defend the uh, Article 2A here with New Hampshire, uh, pursuant to all things firearm and accessory. And that the, uh, should the federal government take action that may be more restrictive that we're gonna hold our own and keep things the way they have been in New Hampshire and maintain the heart. I mean, it's a broad given right to self-defense by any means and every means possible. Representative Muse. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am um, definitely not going to support this bill. Um, uh, essentially, what this would do is it would it would act to cut off public debate. Uh, I understand the desire to protect uh, the Second Amendment, uh, but clearly we're doing it at the expense of the First Amendment. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I don't believe that we should be uh, tying the hands of future legislators um, when it comes to uh, to changing our gun laws, especially thing, especially laws uh, that would actually increase safety um, for gun owners and other members of the public. Um, this is uh, this is bad public policy, and to put it in the state constitution. Um, is just a huge mistake. Oh, and one other thing that I did want to also raise additionally is it is extremely challenging and difficult to try to respond uh, to executing these bills with absolutely no notice uh, that they're coming. Um, as a courtesy uh, to other members of the committee, I would ask the chairman going forward uh, to at least uh, give us notice of a few minutes of which bills will be. Representative Hughes, if you are, I understand the preference that you are making. Right now, just you're recognized to speak on the, whether in support or opposition of the motion of not the past CACRE. If you want to discuss the, the practice of the chair, that's for a different time. You may not recognize it. So I'd ask that we just stick to the topic for now. I do understand your frustration. <laughs> you wish to continue speaking to CACR8? I am done with CACR8 and I hope the rest of us are as well. I, I will recognize represent, Rep, Representative Bradley's speech. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will be opposing this bill as well, and I agree with Representative Muse. Um, it just doesn't allow, allow for any debate going forward. Um, this really ties the hands of, of anybody that wants to talk about sensible um, gun legislation. Um, so I, I, I agree with this wholeheartedly, and I oppose. Thank you, Representative Bradley. Representative Kesterman. I mean, I'll be supporting this, but it's been about cutting off debate. Um, we're seeing that every day today. This doesn't make it good or not. You can't talk about uh, election. You can't talk about uh, some question about vaccines. You kicked off of Facebook. 
That's just not an excuse. Besides, there's a tenth amendment that says people, the people get to make these kinds of states and people get to make these kinds of decisions, not the federal government. Representative Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I'll also be opposed to this bill. And mainly because I think that some of the language even goes to bringing up uh, votes and, and voting on it. And it just seems that uh, this cuts off the debate and that would be in our constitution. And the kind of uh, co that the previous member just talked about not being able to debate, that, that's something that private companies have done. None of that is in the constitution. So I will be opposed to this vote. I'm, a vote. I'm opposed to the way we did this executive hearing and I won't have anything else to say about this. We have no way to prepare. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your objection to the executive session has been noted. Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a note here myself and I want a question about that. Do we have an amendment to the CRA? And is it in the works or what? There, I have not seen any amendment, nor has anyone offered an amendment on. Okay. I wanted to clarify it so I can cross this off. Representative Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question. Uh, to the members who oppose of this on the basis that it makes that it stifles public uh, input. Um, and the question is, you do realize that should this pass the House and the Senate, it will go on to the ballot for the citizens of New York to vote on, which I can't think of any other way to get more public input by putting the question directly to the residents of the state of New Hampshire. Rep Representative Bordney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the clerk can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong, but I sort of remember the NRA uh, and uh, Penny and uh, other bar arms groups uh, saying this was a bad bill. So I don't know why we're uh, spending much time on it. Thank you. Representative Yaffer. Um, I also want to oppose this bill. Um, I just want to um, remind people that um, at the end of the day of that hearing, the support was 35 and the, the opposition was 166. And even more importantly, <laughs> uh, gun owners of America were neutral. So, uh, you know, that alone, uh, you know, by itself says that obviously there's other more work to be done or there's a problem with this bill. Representative Rhodes. Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to um, say something in regards to, with respect to what Representative Terry Gaffrey just said, which was, we do hear that a lot that, you know, how many people were here today testify, but I think that sometimes we fail to take into account how many people have come up to us in our person and or sent countless emails that we all received. And my personal email exploded with, Overwhelmingly, yes to all anything that was related to any kind of firearm. I just want to point that out. Representative Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question since I was not here for this debate. So could you or, or someone in the room remind me the threshold uh, if this makes it to the ballot to then become law? What's the number that it would have to hit? I'm going to answer this and I hope I get it right. I'm sure someone will correct me. I believe in the House, it's requiring a 60% vote as well as the Senate. And at that point, if it's on the ballot, you need two thirds. You know what? You did. I believe you're right. Okay. I thought if it went on the ballot, it would be the majority. Two oh, thirds. No, no. Two thirds. Two thirds. Two -thirds. Two -thirds. Two -thirds. Even on the ballot, it's 60%. Definitely. The pass in the House is the American part. We 
The other comment that I would like is at least when we get the, um, the testify sheet, we can see the telephone numbers. And one thing I can say is the majority of those were 603 numbers, all right? However, what comes in our mailbox is from all over the United States. Yes, it is. So, I, it, so basically, if I'm going to pay attention to something, I'm going to be looking at, you know, where those uh, people that are, are for or closing or or um, for a bill, I'm really looking at their telephone numbers or their addresses that they provide that. <clears throat> and it will say that it. In respect to that, if it does get the 60% voted, signed, and it goes to the ballot, every person, whether they were in support or opposition to this, assuming they are a resident of the state at the time, will be have an opportunity to vote on it. And I think that will be the vote that matters most. Um, but that's not to discredit the issue here. I think we can move the matter to window. Um, well, we really, really don't discuss that. Seeing no, no hands raised from for anyone who hasn't spoke already, uh, would like to speak. You may, you may raise your hand now and speak. But we do want to keep things moving because, as we get, ladies and gentlemen, we got a lot of bills. I uh, think we need to keep, it, keep things going. So, seeing no hands raised for people who haven't. Uh, spoke already. The clerk would not call the roll, and now we put the question if the motion is off the pass. If you would support, please say yay. If you oppose, please say yay. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burt. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yes. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathright. No. Representative Pantalakis. No. Representative O'Hearn. We have this happen again. Well, let's continue with the roll and then I'll address okay. that. Representative Bordenay? No. Representative Muse? No. Representative Newman? No. Representative Bolden? No. Representative Conley? No. Representative Pine Knight? No. Representative Bradley? No. Representative Gaffrey, did Representative O'Hearn get disconnected? I don't see him now. I see him up there. You see him? Yeah. The chair is, is contemplating. Can you see him? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't see him. Pretty no. sure or her. Or or maybe, maybe that's Ray. <laughs> no, that's Ray. I'm sorry. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 11 9. I voted 11 yeas and 9 nays. The motion is not to pass. Representative Wallace, will you prepare a, a majority report? Would someone perhaps like to step up and write one? 
Someone needs to write the majority of the Oh, so somebody writing the minority report? So it's going to coordinate? The board you can recognize. I think you're muted. Take a quick chair. Um, I am a little concerned about what bills we are exacting on each day. Uh, I understand, that in it, it's legal to to exact bills that uh, we are hearing the day that we are without any other notice. So, we've heard on other days. Uh, without public notice, I think is an issue. Uh, there, uh, should, there are people that are interested in those bills, and if they're not no, noticed that they are going to be an executive session, then uh, you didn't complain last year. What was it a little less? Representative Borden, your concern is understandable. I will say that this, the rules. Uh, that we have adopted permit the executive sessions to be conducted this way. On um, under regular circumstances, I would share your philosophy on how to schedule executive sessions. I'm not going to field other questions or any responses to what I'm saying now. This is the rule. The chair has the discretion to call the executive session. Representative, I'm not going to recognize anyone to speak. So if you want to keep your hand up, you can. I'm just explaining this it's within the discretion of the chair. If I even hinted and when executive sessions were going to be called. A lot of it depends on the scheduling and how much time we have in between the hearings. So I couldn't even give you an act, but I want to lay it out for you. I couldn't actually do it. So it would be more misleading for me to give you a schedule that no one would follow it. But this is permitted. And I recommend to everyone, for any bills that have public hearing, to be prepared for the going forward the executive session. Uh, that's the best I can offer right now. Uh, the only, and I've been very, I would say I've been very fair with it. I don't, I don't, when people get up, I don't try to take advantage of the situation. So I'm not going to take any questions on this right now. We're going to move on to the next executive session. I want to use the hour and a half we have uh, wisely. If you'd like to discuss your concerns with me after, you can do our own time, right? So this time, I'm going to close the executive session on CACR8. At this time, we're going to open, open the executive session on House Bill 93. The chair recognizes Representative Hopper to make a, a motion to retain. The chair withdraws that recognition of Representative Hopper. The chair recognizes Representative, Representative Welch. Make a motion we retain House Bill 93. That motion is seconded by Representative Wallace. Does anyone wish to discuss? Representative Hughes, you are recognized to discuss the motion to retain House Bill 93. Thank you. Um, this is probably the biggest trash bill that's been submitted to us so far. Um, nine pages long, um, uh, a cryptic fiscal note, and only people from out of state who came to testify on it. I have absolutely no idea why the motion wasn't to ITL this bill. I, yeah. Representative Gaffer. I would have to agree 100% with uh, Representative Hughes, um, and particularly once he said no state has passed the filter bill. I mean, no other state has even wanted to adopt the bill, and we are retaining it. <clears throat> there you go. Listen, if you're, if you're, now's the time to speak up. It's feeling like you can convince Representative Welch to withdraw his motion. That's, yeah. You've done it. You got, you've done it before. I will work for a motion to retain the bill. You just did it again. That's three times you've done it. 
<laughs> Respect the process, everyone. All right, so let, and then we don't have to do a roll call to withdraw the motion to retain. No. It is, I'm just going to, for the sake of it, is there a second to withdraw that motion, even though we don't need a second? Oh. Representative Walsh was seconded that request. Hey, all right, but now the floor is open. Would someone like to be wrapping the representative part of your hands up? Oh, let me take it down. I just had a comment. Now it's down. Representative Bourdain, your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to uh, uh, make to rule this bill inexpedient to legislate. ITL. I mean, second. I mean, I never got to second yet. <laughs> <laughs> Representative May, we thank you recognize the second the motion to ITL. Thank you. I second it. Thank you. It's official now. <laughs> it's uh well, it's already been discussed by a few members. Is there any further discussion to have on on the motion of next week to legislate House Bill 93? Representative Burke, your hand is raised again. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to state for the record that I have a new friend on this bill, Representative Muse, and I'm going to vote with him because I totally agree what he said. I mean, it, 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 I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Representative Newman. You're mute. You thought mute yourself. Never wanting to miss an opportunity to agree with Representative Burt, I also will vote to ITL this bill. You sure you don't want to retain it? <laughs> Seeing no hands raised, the clerk will now call the roll. The matter being put the question is the a motion of inexpedient to legislate. If you are in support of the motion to inexpedient to legislate, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Hopper. No. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. No. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gethray. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Representative Blackson got you. Yes. Representative Bordenay. Yes. Representative Muse. Yes. Representative Newman. Representative Newman, you need to unmute yourself. Yes. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Chairman Abbas. Two votes yes. I did not because I didn't take this. Oh, her. Oh. Representative O'Hearn. I think that text me is having phone problems. Two. As a uh, Vote of 18 yeas and two nays. The motion of inexpedient to legislate passes. Now we'll go on consent. Any objections? Seeing okay. none, we now close the executive session on House Bill 93.
This time, we will open the executive session of the House Bill 129. Uh, I just want to pass. Would you like to recognize to make a motion? Is there a second to that motion? A second by Representative Bruce? I'll second it. Uh, it was, oh, Representative, you're out of order. Oh, he already did. Okay. Thank you, sir. Representative Justin, do you wish to speak to your motion? I think earlier today I, I spoke to my motion. I'm just getting more and more concerned with intrusion on my privacy, with my iPhone, and everything else that I log in. I now open the question up for discussion. Representative Knight. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, thank you, everyone. I really um, am sorry. Uh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, um, Representative, but I just don't find this necessary at all because whenever you download something or enter into a contract, with an electronic company, tech company, you as the consumer are already made aware in fine print of your rights. And you actually have to click on, I accept these rights in order to use this software or hardware, or it is your choice to go on your daily business. And that is a contract that's already enabled and, and informs people of the rights. What this is gonna do is not change anything except there's a fiscal note, which is gonna cost our people money. I don't think this is enforceable with your intent. Your intent is good, I get it. We shouldn't be taking advantage of people that don't know what's happening on their electronic devices. But again, it's the consumer's responsibility. And with that, I, I can't support this. I don't think it's fair to people that are aware and know how to use technology and for the taxpayers to pay, uh, you know, on something that somebody else just isn't educated enough on how to turn their privacy settings on is just not fair to the rest of the people of the state. Thank you, Representative Knight. Representative Muse. I would have to agree with Representative Klein Knight. Um, I think one of the things that's incumbent on everybody in the digital age is to know how to manage their own individual privacy settings. Uh, and when it came to finding the COVID app, app uh, Representative Testerman didn't have any problems finding it. And when he found it, it hadn't been activated. He chose not to activate it. He wasn't tracked. I don't understand why we need a state law in this situation. Seeing no further hands up. Representative Bordnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a question. Is is this bill going to a second committee? It's an excellent question. I don't believe so. <laughs> it looks like it should be have come to, to commerce but first anyway. I don't know if it's going to Well, to the extent that it is, the second committee can wave off too, so nothing's guaranteed. But. Seeing no further hands raised, but the matter we put the question, the, mo the clerk called the roll. The motion is hot to pass. If you support the motion, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. 
Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burt. Yes. Representative Popper. Yes. Representative Green. Yay. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testament. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yay. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathray. No. Representative Pantalakis. Take a minute. <clears throat> Representative Pantalakis, can you unmute and turn the video on? No. <laughs> I, I've taken it off. I'm 100% positive that's you. I still need you to, to turn the video on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is it's me. Representative O'Hearn. Representative Bordenay. No. Representative News. No. Representative Newman. No. Representative Bolden. No. Representative Conley. No. Representative Klein Knight. No. Representative Bradley. No. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. Chairman votes 11 time. By a vote of 11 to 9, 11, 11 yeas and 9 nays, the motion of five to pass passes. So, Professor, will you be preparing a majority report? You put our consent. Was somebody preparing the minority report? I will take uh, just to take the pressure off Casey. Very <laughs> nice of you. You guys are very fortunate to have. That. This time we will close the executive session on House Bill 129. At this time, the chair will open the executive session on House Bill 485. The chair is recognized and Representative Popper making a motion of pot to pass. I believe you are offering an amendment. Is that correct? If I'm wrong, is that amendment 2021-0409H? Wow, you're psychic. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, make a motion about the pass on House Bill 485, and I would move uh, amendment uh, 0409H. Is there a second? I'll second it. That is that. Motion has been seconded by Representative Bird. Representative Hopper, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Um, I think uh, the amendment just basically clarifies this. I'll go ask and I can't remember. Uh, that if somebody stopped and the police officer asked to search the car, there has to be verification that the person gave their consent. So I support the amendment and the bill. I think the, uh, especially for younger people when they're confronted with a police officer and the police officer says, you know, I'd like to search your car, is that all right? Their, their natural inclination is to be bullied into, into saying yes. And this gives them that understanding that they do not have to say yes. And if they do say yes, there's documentation so that it's not disputable later on. And just to speak on that point, the amendment, <coughs> specifically lines 11 and 12, they all does add a single sentence to the original bill. And essentially, if an officer fails to comply with the provisions of this section, uh, as a matter of law, the search is going to be deemed to be non consensual. I will say, and this is 
is particularly relevant in possession cases. Uh, when a, an officer searches the vehicle, the, the real defense to that is, uh, at least the majority of it, would often, would often be whether the search itself was lawful. Uh, if, a, if a person consents to the search, all of the search and seizure laws uh, is, is a, we could spend hours, a semester of uh, lecturing on search and seizure laws, which we certainly won't do that today. But if you consent to the search, all that's out the door. Here, the concern is that he said, she said, whether the person consented or not. Uh, this bill is very specific. We did a great job identifying it as being right or by some body reporting. I know uh, hopefully one day the body cameras will solve that for us, but most officers that I would hope have some type of smartphone that would have a recording on as well. Either way, the point is, is that this would just failure to comply with it. They're not going to then be able to say, oh, well, the person consented to search. It does not change any other part of the bill. It's just that one sentence. Representative Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't have a copy of this amendment. Was, was it sent out? I certainly hope so. Do the people at home have? I don't have the amendment to this bill. I, was it sent electronically or uh, I certainly don't have one uh, printed off. I think it was on the state website, uh, state emails. I think Karen sent it, Mr. Chair. My understanding the uh, committee assistant uh, sent it out electronically. But what I will just, I can, although it's preferred that I would read, I'll just read the one line sentence. And this literally adds one sentence beginning on line 11. It says, an officer who fails to comply with the requirements of this paragraph or who sees with a search shall, as a matter of law, be conducting a search without consent. That's all the amendment adds. It doesn't change any other fundamental part of the bill, bill itself. <coughs> Representative Marston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two inquiries, if I may. Who seconded the bill? We represented part. And my last question is, to move to uh, the representative that gives us the support numbers and opposed numbers. Did he give us that yet? This piece of legislation supporting and opposing. Representative, you give the honors. Um, let me see just a moment. And we are on. There were 96 people who signed in in support of this bill two who signed in in opposition, and one person who signed in as neutral. All right. Representative True. <clears throat> I apologize, Mr. Chair, but I think you, you made a comment that the only change was conducting a search without consent. But, but the other change is uh, establishment and documenting consent. But documenting consent wasn't in the original bill, correct? Right? That's not what I had. Uh, let me just confirm that. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Troy. I thank you for pointing that out. There is enough that I think the second sentence of the amendment is also there. Point that out. And that line says if a person consents to a search, the officer will first document the person's consent either in writing or by audio recording, and then they conduct the search. That is also a change. So I do uh catch Representative Troy. Well, Thank you for pointing that out. What I stated before was inaccurate. Thank you. And what that, what that does is that, first of all, that clarifies it. That should be done prior to the search. If you're going to document that it's been done, it, it, it should be done. You know, that, 
documenting it after the fact is, I don't think, going to be very successful. Um, way it is working. Anyone else wish to speak? See, seeing no hands, right? Can I just say something? Can you give us a few minutes because we're trying to get them the um the actual over. bill? So we just sent it so he can take a look at it because he really should not be voting if he hasn't seen the bill. Has the people at home not seen anyone else not seen the amendment? I'll just ask for the sense of Representative Newman, do you wish to speak? Uh, I'm not seeing the bill. I looked through all my emails and I saw a letter. Uh, I think it was one that you sent to Karen at some time from your iPhone. I've seen no, no response to that for an amendment. I'll also be voting against the bill without a copy of the amendment. Thank you. Uh, you send it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm in the process of forwarding this to uh, members who are not present in the room. Uh, it's, a, it's a consuming process of adding one's number manually, so I am doing this as fast as I can and trying to get this out. Uh, Keep going. No, no, no. Keep going. You're doing good. My apologies. And I can't wait to be on. So while Representative Conley is forwarding a copy of the amendment, should Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could we have the secretary send us those amendments when they come out to the addresses that she sends our emails to? I that's the that's the purpose of the chair as well. Um, I, in fairness, to, there was a lot of amendments sent her today, and she received oversight on. It was collective oversight. But we're fortunate to have Representative Conley cleaning up our mess. Thank you. Chairman, point of order. Well, I make that a parliamentary inquiry. Well, point of order is a parliamentary inquiry. I, hope um, I just want to make sure that I have that I'm appropriately asking a question, and I'm recognized. Representative, your question. I just have a question. Would it be possible for the chairman 
if in fact we're going to be doing a series of executive sessions today and he has knowledge of, of those executive of the bills that are going to be exact that at least we have that much information so that we can find the bills and the amendments and bring to the chair's attention when we don't have the appropriate information. Thank you. Representative Newman, I'll answer that question again while we can patiently wait for Representative Conley to forward the amendment. If I were to give a, provide a list of, of bills that I anticipated on, a, on having the executive session on and gave you a precise order, it would be nothing short of a miracle that we stuck to that schedule. So rather than create a schedule that I'm not confident that I can keep, and then it suggests that I'm misleading or whatnot, I'm not going to recognize it. I already said I'm not going to recognize it again, but I'm just, we have some downtime while, while Representative Conley's assisting the committee. I will tell you that it is, the rules permit an executive session to be performed um, at any time after the public hearing is concluded. That's a, that's a rule, and that's a house rule. It's also noticed that way in the count. I will say it is a rule that is new for this, this term. With that being said, I would prepare for bills to be executed at any given time thereafter. Uh, I will also point out that if we have 20 minutes of downtime, that is a, rather than sit around and say it from nine o'clock and everyone gets mad at me because we get to nine o'clock, I say we use that 20 minutes during sunlight and we conduct an executive session. And that's the discretion of the chair and that's how we're, I'm gonna conduct the meetings. And I'm not gonna entertain any more questions on that topic. President Conley, how are we looking? Uh, it's been sent via email to members in the committee for not present. I'm going to ask the people, uh, the representatives working remotely, to review their emails, please. And amendment. Zero four zero nine eight should be in your emails. I got that. We're just saving time. Lines eleven and twelve, as well as lines six and seven, are the. Issues, and that's what we have confirmed to the event. Please take a minute to review. Do the members working remotely, were they able to access the amendment? Just a thumbs up will do. Representative Newman, you have not been able to access the amendment? Knight, do you have a question? Um, I, if I may, uh, just to, um, some of us just got it, so I think they're in the process of just reading it over now. Oh yes, I'm just asking if you have it. Not if just, you know, I want to make sure it's actually <clears throat> made it through cyberspace. Representative Conley, thank you for the assist your assistance. It is greatly appreciated. Thank <laughs> you. 
their dependence. That's the that's the one that I don't want to accept that. Just ask me Yeah. Talk about that too, so. right. If you've read the amendment, please give a thumbs up as well. Representative Muse. I, I, I do have a have a question on the, the on the amendment. Um, the original bill. Um, uh, only required uh, the officer to uh, inform the person that the, the amended bill uh, seems to require uh, them to document their consent, either in writing or in audio. What I'm curious about is, is does that, what happens to that record? Um, how is that record made? Is there a form in existence that would do that? Um, where are those records stored? Who's looking at them? Is there, is there a process around the paperwork? I guess that's my question. A lot of questions there, I can answer some of them. So I, the best I can do is compare this to the, the Miranda form. You know, normally when there's a charge, someone's arrested, they, they, they're often read their Miranda rights and then they provide them a form to sign acknowledging that it's been read for them. And it's, it's really uh, it's somewhat repetitive, but it's signed. That's usually part of the arrest record, and then that's often turned over to the uh, county, to the uh, district attorney. And it's often produced in the discovery. So I would imagine that if there was a form, uh, whether it's a paper form, it would be maintained in the same manner, consistent with that. Keep in mind, it might not always be an arrest. Uh, in addition to that, if there was a video recording, I think it could be maintain the same way. In cases I worked on, there's been photographs and or videos taken by officers on their own personal cell phone devices that has then been turned over uh, discovery. So those are that, those are ways to do that. So and my understanding from the testimony you heard that some departments already have a standard form and they're and they're already following this process. I guess another question would be, um, given the fact that some communities may not have that uh, and that the, the state police don't have it, should this bill have a fiscal note? You're talking about a fiscal note for the, the piece of paper? I, I do understand that it, it is just a piece of paper, but... Um, I spent half my career moving people off of uh, paper-based benefits enrollment to online benefits enrollment. So I understand a, a little bit about uh, how one piece of paper uh, can be very problematic in a process. I'm gonna go off pure memory. My understanding of 25 says that it's not, if it's the fiscal note is below uh, a certain threshold, it's actually not required. I believe that is ten thousand dollars. I would like to say it's either rule thirty-five or thirty-seven. Someone wants to fact check that. But my understanding is, I, I don't. Think, I would find it. I wouldn't anticipate ten thousand dollars being spent on paper. Put it on Facebook. Don't fact check it. <laughs> but I, I, I believe in that. So with that being said, I don't believe in this case. But this one would be necessary. I actually believe that this will save a lot of money because if you don't have to, in possession cases, the majority of the defense that is involved in that is from one of these suppression hearings. This has, if, we, if this is done specifically done the right way, it could clear up some court time, which would free up the officers being paid overtime for the suppression hearings, which would free up the county attorneys who are prosecuting, so it would free up the courts. Of course, there's actually a lot of uh, savings is good actually now. Uh, I'm not sure, I, it's hard to quantify what that would be, but like I said a lot of these are, are often decided on, on pre trial uh, procedures. Anyone? Representative Welch. 
Oh, wait, wait. I mean, we have other shows that we can do that. Is that one being able to person use the I don't have it. Oh, I did? Oh, actually, I've seen that, yes. They want an opportunity to speak at, uh, about the event that would like to speak. Seeing no hands raised, the matter will be put to question. This is it's the motion of the task. The, the question is to whether to adopt Amendment 2021-0409H. Clerk can up all the walls. You are in favor, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Hopper. For sure. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gaffright. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Again. She's frozen. She didn't pay her heat bill or something? I just keep, keep going. Okay. Roll. <laughs> Representative O'Hearn. Representative Bourdain. Yes. I'm sorry, did you say yay? Yes. yes. Representative Muse. No. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Yeah. Did not see her, Mr. Chairman. She was as bad. Oh, she's, she's, she's trying to fix it. Oh, here she is. And she's moving this time. It's on you while we can. We got you. Uh, my computer went out on me. Yes. <coughs> Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 19 yay, one day. Ah. Oh, mute, muse. Mr. Chair, can I clarify that we were voting on the amendment? Yes. Yeah. We were voting on the amendment. Thank you. My understanding, uh, that if these paper hard works this morning, also will against the amendment. So, this is the end. I was checked for something. All right, sorry. 19, yay, one day. At this time, we know this motion of odd cast is amended. Representative Hopper, you're recognized to make a motion of the pass as amended. I make a motion of the pass as amendment on House Bill 45. I'll second it. That is, Representative Burke, you are recognized to second the motion of the pass as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does anyone wish to discuss? Seeing no hands raised, uh, the, the matter we put the question, the clerk can call the roll. The question is, um, the motion is not to pass as amended. If you are in favor, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burt. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yep. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathright. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Yes. Representative O'Hearn. Representative Bordenay. Yes. 
Representative News. Yes. Representative Newman. Representative Newman? Yes. Representative Bolden? Yes. Representative Conley? Yes. Representative Klein Knight? Yes. Representative Bradley? Yes. Chairman Abbas? The chair votes yes. yes. What's the number? 20. Zero. Zero. Okay, put up 20 days and zero days. Motion to auto pass amended. Passed. That will be put on consent. So we'll be ready to grant drafting a story report. Good. We're At this point in time, we close the executive session on House Bill 45. At this time, the chair is now going to open the executive session on House Bill 180. Before I begin, there was an amendment involving this. It's amendment 2021 0 Members participate remotely. Please do those members have a copy of this amendment. Thumbs up or thumbs down would be appreciated. 0397. Thank you. 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 Thank you have a copy of it? Oh, for thumbs up now. Thumbs up. Thank you. The team made no reaction as we have a copy of it. The chair is recognizing our Representative Wallace to make a motion to the pass and to offer the amendment 2021-0397. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I move uh, on to pass and offer the amendment. Uh, the amendment does make a carve out for individuals under the age of 20 uh, that would get caught up in this particular. Will there be a second to that? I'll second. Seconded by Representative Hurst. Sorry about that. Thank you. 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 Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for forging ahead. But uh, again, this amendment provides a carve out for uh, individuals that haven't attained the age of 20 uh, that may get caught up in this type of activity. Uh, this amendment is supported by all stakeholders. And uh, this bill has been moving forward through this committee for the last five years at this point in time. It looks like it's finally ready for prime time. Any other discussion? Seeing no hands raised, the matter will be put to question. The question, the matter being put to question, is whether to adopt Amendment 2021-0397H. First, call the roll. If you're in support of adopting the amendment, please say yay. If you're opposed, please say nay. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Bird. Um, yes. He doesn't have the amendment. Oh. Um, we have... Let's say it. We're in the voting room, so I'm not going to stop it. Representative Hopper. Yes. Yeah. Representative Green. Yes. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Yeah. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathray. No. Representative Pantalakis. Yes. Representative O'Hearn. Representative Bordenay. Um, yes. Representative Muse. No. 
Representative Newman. No. Representative Bolden. No. Representative Conley. No. Representative Klein Knight. No. Representative Bradley. No. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 13 yay, 7 nay. I voted 13 yays and 7 nays. The amendment is adopted. President Wallace, you wish to recognize it for a motion to block the pass as amended? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I move that uh, House Bill 180 be ought to pass as amended. Representative Burt, do you wish to second that motion to block the pass as amended? Yes, please, Mr. Chairman. The members who are participating remotely, uh, I asked several times if you have a copy of the amendment to provide thumbs up or thumbs down. Do the members have a copy of the amendment? Please, a thumbs up or thumbs down would be appreciated. Getting no reaction, which is not responsive. So we're trying to provide a copy of things, but thank you. <clears throat> Representative Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh I did just send an image of the uh amendment directly to Representative Mutes via email and it was blocked on his end. I'm not going to try to get it to him. So. Representative Marston. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my usual question from uh, Representative Hughes support and opposed on this bill? 196. On, 190, on this bill, there were 196 people who were in favor of it and two people who were opposed. What was it? Representative, is that two people that were opposed? Two people opposed, yes. What I will say is that I've seen no hands raised. I've never really put the question. Uh, the question is, uh, the motion is off the pass as amended. If you support of the motion of off the pass as amended, please say yay. If you are opposed, please say nay. The clerk in the poll vote. Vice Chairman Welch. Yes. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Hopper. Yes. Representative Green. <clears throat> yay. Representative Wallace. Yes. Representative Testerman. Yes. Representative True. Yay. Representative Pratt. Yes. Representative Marston. Yay. The clerk votes yes. Representative Harriet Gathright. Yes. Representative Pantalakis. Yeah. So the table actually got to eat itself. Yes. Representative O'Hearn. Representative Borden A. Representative News. Yes. Representative Newman. Yes. Representative Bolden. Yes. Representative Conley. Yes. Representative Klein Knight. Yes. Representative Bradley. Yes. Chairman Abbas. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman, the vote is 20. We have 20 yeas and zero nays. The motion of five pass is amended. Last, and now we cross the Senate. This time we'll close the executive session on House Bill 180. And the Criminal Justice Public Safety Committee, this time will be adjourned.